Welcome to Paranormal M, where we delve into the depths of the supernatural. Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications, or drop a comment, and join us on our quest for answers. We guarantee a riveting exploration of the unknown that'll leave you spellbound. Ask Reddit. I have multiple I believe I was a target for a demonic possession or something paranormal for most of my childhood. And, quite frankly, my young adult life. I have a lot of stories about my experiences, but I always highlight a few when I tell them to people. I was raised to believe in whatever I wanted by my family that there's, I guess you could say, that they're not churchgoers. However, they are mainly agnostic, and I'm atheist. My mom didn't believe me for years, and now she does. My best friend didn't believe me, and now he does. My ex didn't believe me, and now she does too. I've thought about going to church just to ask for some information. However, I haven't been bothered by it for a few years. Take what you want from this. I pride myself on my honesty, and none of this is made up. Some of these stories are not too scary, but I need to tell them. Some things will sound like a normal day-to-day -day issue people that have, but you know, try to trust me when I say these are not. The first recollection I have of it was in grade two. I was in bed trying to fall asleep. This orb was floating around in my room. It was white on the back and slightly opaque, just whizzing around the room. I was scared right away. It randomly stopped, and it felt like it was looking at me. Then I just froze in fear. It charged me. I snapped out of the paralysis, ran to my mom's room, who was angry. I woke her up, and it put me back in my room. This is when I started to sleep under the covers with a light on till I was 19. I was quote-unquote haunted for years. Little things would happen, like shit would go missing or stuff would move, but I just got used to it. Not like your car keys or wallet, but my glasses would not be where I placed them on the nightstand beside me when I would fall asleep. They would usually be downstairs on a counter or in a cupboard. I would feel like something was watching me from time to time, and not that normal sixth sense you feel when someone is watching you. Completely different level. Shit like this became a semi-normal life for me. Whenever we moved, it would follow. Let's start with grade 11 around Xmas. My mother got divorced, and, well, me, my cat Tiger, we were living at my grandparents' home. My mom was on a vacation in a warm country, and my grandparents were in Arizona. House was all to myself. This isn't some Hollywood scary grandparents' house. It's a new, basically premium condo in the suburbs. My room was downstairs. And when you leave the bedroom, there's a big living room straight in front with an older TV in the corner. Directly in the corner of the living room. There's also a bathroom to the left. I woke up in the middle of the night not able to breathe. I felt a force on top of me, and not like a fatty sitting on you, but like as if the blankets on top of me weren't movable. That feeling, I just... Or something like watching you and it was stronger than it had ever been. The door which I'd closed was wide open, with all the lights being off, including the lamp that I always leave on when I go to sleep. And by the way, I always leave this on. I was terrified. This is the scariest moment in my life. Then all of a sudden, Tiger, my pet cat, jumped onto the bed, all bushy-tailed and hissing. The lights turned on by themselves, and I was relieved by which is my best guess, is that it, Tiger, jumps off the bed and stays in the bedroom at the door, staring all bushy-tailed and hissing at this corner of the living room where the TV is. 
It's pitch black, and I felt it instantly when I looked into the corner. This horrible, intent feeling. Like when someone who hates you is looking at you with the intent to kill. This corner of the living room should have been lit up from the light in the bedroom, but it was pitch black. I had to call my uncle and tell him I needed to pick me up right away. He had to come to my bedroom to just behold me in my underwear because I was too scared to get dressed in case it came after me again. Tiger's eyes didn't leave that corner of the room until my uncle came. My uncle got mad when I told him the reason that he had to wake me to get me. Thankfully, by this time my mom already believed me. I'm 17, ladies and gents. A full-grown young man had to call his uncle to get him. My best thoughts on Tiger saving me was, I guess, maybe the ancient Egyptians' belief about cats. Look it up, I think there's a little truth in everything. My memory gets a little fuzzy here without time frames. However, I was hanging out with my best friend at his house and he knows about quote-unquote it, but doesn't believe anything I tell him about it. Until this night at his place. My best bud's family's rich. He has a big double-door entrance room with one very small window and this huge king-sized bed and an 80-inch commuter, excuse me, 80-inch computer monitor, which really is just a TV. We were downstairs in his room on his bed watching Paranormal Activity 1 on his computer monitor while eating Pizza 73. The doors were closed and the tiny window shut. The pizza box was set up by the computer chair in front of the TV. The whole bottom of the box was on the seat with the whole pizza in the bottom part of the Pizza 73 box, with the lid being a little bit open. So in the middle of the movie, the box lid folds up and opens completely by itself. We look at each other and look back and the pizza box shoots off the chair and lands on the floor. After that, my best friend believed me and started to hate it. It came over a different time and we were talking about it. He randomly got up all mad and started to mock and attempt to talk to it by yelling into the air. He said something along the lines of, Leave my friend alone, you coward. Blah, 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 blah. Shit like that. We hung out and it was time to go to sleep. I passed out on the couch in the downstairs living room. He fell asleep on the recliner. This is the first time it has done something to someone besides me. I was already half asleep when all this happened. So this story is what he had told me the next morning, which I remember some parts of. He was asleep, woke up to the flashlight being on, which was odd, so he guessed that it was it. He tried to wake me up, which I just said to go back to sleep. He screwed the light all the way so there was no way to turn back. Then put it down. He woke up again to the light on. I remember this light turning on and him freaking out with what happened next. So we shut it off again and this time woke up to being pulled off of the recliner with the light on again. It scared him and we actually never talked about it for a long time. My ex was Mexican and Catholic. She had Jesus pictures and crosses and Catholic stuck pretty much everywhere. She knew about it, and it took a few months after we moved in together for her to believe me. Especially that weird stuff happened whenever I was home. After she believed me, she wanted to go to a card reader who was a friend of hers. She promised that she didn't say anything about it to this card reader or anything pertaining to scary stuff. However, this card reader was horrified by the cards that she drew. She said something was following me, which I already knew. Anyways, there's more, but I've just been typing on my phone forever and I have to work another 12 hours tomorrow. Ask Reddit. My mom's story to me one afternoon when I got home from high school. 
I could tell something was wrong as soon as I saw her. She was visibly upset, so I asked her what happened. For background, she was an interior decorator, and part of her job was kind of sketching out crude floor plan drawings and measuring rooms for flooring. So she gets a call from her lady that is updating your home and wants new flooring, asks my mom to come look at the home, offer suggestions and take measurements. After arranging a time to meet, the lady tells her that she can't make it, or at least will be late, but no worries. The house will be unlocked and there won't be anyone there. This seems a little odd, but mom goes anyway. The house is a typical 1940s bungalow and in need of some updates, but otherwise well kept. Mom knocks, nobody home, so she lets herself in as instructed. She starts her routine of sketching and measuring and she hears a noise coming from the back of the house. Like a doorknob rattling, maybe. But, engrossed in her work, she second-guessed her hearing and continues working. A few minutes go by and she definitely hears it again. So she calls out, Hello, anyone home? No reply. Waiting a few moments, not hearing any other noises. She goes back to sketching. Then she hears the unmistakable sounds of a doorknob turning and a door swinging open, creaking and all, while lightly brushing the carpet as it opened. At this point, she's a little frightened. But she was supposed to be alone, she thought. As she waits silently, she can hear the shuffle of footsteps coming up the hallway toward the room she's in. From the hallway emerges this little old gray-haired lady in a moo-moo and house slippers. Mom is a little relieved that it's, you know, like not an axe murderer or anything like that, so she greets the old lady and apologizes for disturbing her. The lady ignored Mom, continued into the kitchen where she heard a cabinet door open and close. Then the little old lady shuffled back down the hallway to her room and closed the door with a loud thump. She thought it was odd that the lady would ignore her, but maybe she was nearly deaf and blind or something. She looked at least 90, so mom finished up the room that she was in, but she didn't want to disturb the old lady, so she didn't do any of the back rooms. Later, she calls the owner, discusses you know, what she measured and apologized again for disturbing the old lady. Silence on the phone. And then, what old lady? Mom says, the old lady in the back room, I spoke to her when she came out, but I'm not sure that she heard me. More silence. What did she look like? Mom replied. Well, she was short and shuffled her feet coming down the hall in her white house slippers, wearing a multicolored moo-moo dress and glasses and slightly hunched forward and looked about 90 years old. At this point, Mom could hear the lady on the other end of the line breathing in a very distressed way, and she pauses a few seconds and says, You just described my mother. Thinking nothing of it, my mom replies, Yeah, okay. Like I said, please tell her I'm sorry for disturbing her. The owner then says, You don't understand. My mother passed away two months ago. My mom was a little bit white and shaken up and on the verge of tears as she was telling me this 20 years ago. Every time I mention the story again, she gets a little freaked out and she won't discuss it anymore. Ask Reddit. There's a local legend in Albuquerque, New Mexico and it involves a mysterious and supposedly deadly sort of otherworldly creature. Some versions claim that it's manlike and a shapeshifter, capable of blending in with the shadows as it stalks through the desert. Others describe the beast as being curiously canine in nature, albeit with two long limbs, black claws, and eyes that seem to burn like pinprick embers in the darkness. One thing that remains the same through every retelling, though, is the high and eerie keening noise it's said to make when it hunts down its prey. 
One evening when I was about 11 years old, I heard it. I had been lying in bed reading beneath my covers with a flashlight when a mournful howl pierced the air from somewhere across the moonlit sands. My first thought was that it had been a coyote, but as the sound echoed through the night for a second time, I felt a shiver of panic flash up my spine and a deep weight of dread coalesce in my chest. That evil wail was not the call of anything I had ever encountered nor of something that should have even existed in the waking world. It was the cry of a nightmare incarnate, and no amount of reason or rationality could shake me of that notion. Though at around the same time as this story, I'd been doing my best to foster a reputation for being an independent and unflappable badass. That goal went swiftly out the window as the screeches seemed to draw even closer and I quickly ran from my room to seek protection from my parents. Upon reaching their door, though, I was presented with an even more terrifying discovery. The howls were coming from inside the house, along with a lot of heavy breathing and the occasional whisper. I couldn't look my mother in the eye for at least a week. Ask Reddit. When I was a teenager, my dad taught me something about witching the baby and about witching in general. It's a knack that some people have. You either have it or you don't. You can't learn it. It seems to run in families because he, my brother, and myself can do it. The basic idea is that you take a golden ring, hang it from a piece of string, and hold it over a pregnant woman's stomach. The ring will start to swing. If it swings in a circle, it's a girl. If it swings in a line, it's a boy. You can also hold the ring over a woman's wrist to find out the gender of the children that she's had in the past. Or above a person's head to tell what gender that they are. Now, it's just a folk suspicion, right? My dad learned it from his mom, who grew up in the Hebrides in Scotland. And it's exactly the kind of hedge magic you'd get people believing in over time based on confirmation bias. This is, I've personally seen, cases of it working. And of it working defiance of outside factors. I told one of my teachers about it in high school. She asked me to demonstrate. So I did it on her using the over-the-wrist version. It came out completely accurate, swung in a line a couple of times, then stopped, then swung in a circle, and then stopped again. She'd had a boy first, then a girl. She had a photo of her kids on her desk, so I knew that she had two. But I'd never looked close at it. So at the time, I thought that both kids were boys. So it couldn't have been me unconsciously influencing the witching. I had been wrong, but the witching had been right. Now, end of the day, it could have been any number of things. I still don't really believe in it. But at the same time, there's a little part of me. Ask Reddit. I was at Fort Sill for my MOS school, and while I never actually saw anything super crazy, so many other Marines in the barracks have seen or have heard weird shit. The only times that I've personally experienced something was during Firewatch. My first experience was either during the Thanksgiving 96 or when we were about to go on leave for Christmas. Regardless, I was doing my firewatch shift, which is 0000-0400 IIRC. I kept having the sensation of someone watching me as I mindlessly roved around the deck. I wasn't scared or anything, but I was slightly on edge and weirded the fuck out. Around 0200-0300 though, shit got weird. 
I distinctly remember hearing someone make a quiet but audible ha right behind me. It was next to my ear almost as if they were blowing air onto the window. It didn't help that I felt a slight cold shiver go down my neck and back after that. I noped the fuck out of that side of the hallway and decided to stay on the side that actually had light for the rest of my shift. Another time when I just kind of picked up class, I was outside roving around with someone. One thing you should know about the M-A-R-D-E-T battery barracks is that we're literally less than 50 feet away from the base cemetery. More on that in a bit. When me and my partner passed by the cemetery, we both saw a flashing light. At first, I thought it was just a soldier fucking with us, but then the light would stay perfectly still. We ignored it the first time, but on our second and third pass, we saw the same light, and it stayed exactly as it was. A small part of me wanted to go see what it was, but I wasn't about to run the risk of getting possessed or whatever. Other Marines would also have told me stories about what they've seen and heard in the barracks, and those go as follows. One of my buddies at the time told me that he and his roommate were in bed about to go to sleep when their door suddenly opened on its own, slammed shut, and locked itself. Secondly, the cemetery apparently had a resident Satanist visited every now and then. When I was a new join who just arrived, I thought the guys who've been there a while longer were just fucking with me. But they were dead serious. They told me it became such a problem that the PLT sergeants and BG had to give a brief about it. It was like a battery a month or so before me. And my group came to the battery. Thirdly, a decent amount of Marines have tried to kill themselves in some of the rooms over the years. Fort Sill sucks ass. Fuck that place. When I was first checking in and getting my room, the clerk said that my room was supposedly haunted because some dude either tried to hang himself or cut his wrist. Ever since then, according to them, everybody who's ever occupied that particular room has either been dropped from a class or had some other dumb misfortune fall upon them. I didn't believe it at first. I was just a new join at the time, and, well, I thought that the clerks were just fucking with me. But my attitude changed when, just a month later, after coming back from Christmas leave, I popped positive for COVID. That basically forced me to get dropped from the class that I was supposed to originally pick up with. Fourthly, one of my CPLs told me that when he went through the schoolhouse during the firewatch shift, he was out on the quad. He looked at the cemetery and saw a woman in white with noticeable facial features stare back at him. He thought he was just tired, but the woman stuck around for a bit, and that scared the shit out of him. A second later, the woman suddenly disappeared after he blinked. Ask Reddit. This happened when I was a kid, like around 10. We have a garden with many trees, and behind that garden is an empty plot of land that's wild trees. We, which is me and my brother and sister, we used to like playing around the trees and climb the wall connecting the empty plot and our garden. One day in a weird, sort of a bird-looking miniature version of an eagle was sitting on the trees of the empty plot. It looked like it was made of wood, but obviously it was alive as it hopped from branch to branch. We were very curious as we weren't sure about its species, so we started an argument. I said that it was an eagle, but my siblings said it can't be because it's too small. When we were arguing, we heard a strange voice and it said that it was hungry. We started looking around to see who was speaking, but we saw no one. The voice came again and said, You guys decide amongst yourselves who I am going to eat. It was then that we realized that it was a weird bird that was speaking. We were pretty cowardly. All three of us ran away from there. 
a loud voice came from behind us. Boom. And I woke up from my sleep. Anyways, it wasn't just a normal dream, because all three of us, me and my siblings, we had the same dream. We were so fucking scared, and the most scary thing is that we saw that bird sitting on a tree in our garden that very day. We avoided our garden for months. Ask Reddit. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but two in particular stand out. First one was when I was a child in the 70s. My parents had friends and some of our relatives over one evening. They occasionally played with tarot cards and Ouija boards and these little parties. These were there. Well, nothing intense, no candles or anything. Mom said usually whatever the Ouija board said was usually not something that would make sense like a spirit they talked to more than once that claimed to have been a Viking that was an ancestor of my mom's. We didn't have Viking ancestors, so it was never really taken seriously whatsoever. Well, I guess one night whatever they talked to was something dark, and it made Mom uncomfortable and they all stopped playing, got put away in the game closet. Well, two days later, the Ouija board caught on fire. Just the Ouija board. And that's why Ouija boards became forbidden in our household. Oh yeah, and one year later we did indeed discover we had some Viking ancestors while doing our genealogy. But the second story was in the 90s. I worked in a Toys R Us that everybody said was haunted. We couldn't hardly keep an overnight crew because of it. We were doing a bit of a remodel and was put in charge of an overnight crew of about 12 people. In about two weeks, all but two had quit. So, one night it's me and one of the two that hadn't quit. The other one had called in sick, or had the day off or something, but... So it was just me and her locked in overnight. All night it was super uneventful. We go to take our lunch break, and we're sitting there at the table in the break room eating. Suddenly, a penny falls between us. Then a second one, then a third. Now, at the time, I had a co-worker who was something of a prankster. So I looked up, expecting to see that he or somebody else had wedged pennies into the ceiling tiles. Nope. No pennies. Then another one falls, and a few more. It's freaking starting to rain pennies. We ran out of there and listened at the door. A little while after it got quiet in there and we went back in and pennies were everywhere. All over the table, the floor, the couch. She quit on the spot. I still have a jar with those pennies, by the way. It was almost three dollars worth of pennies. Ghost Tube App, my experience. So I learned about its existence online. There was a guy who would communicate with ghosts at a cemetery and random words would be said in English. I was skeptical but enjoy paranormal stuff, so I decided to download it and try it out. I live in Japan, and I was curious if the words would be said in English. If it was, that was my way of disproving the legitimacy of it. Well, when I tried it, all I heard was sounds like, almost like laughter. No words I could pick up on. I was speaking to it in Japanese, and every time I spoke, a noise would be made. So I thought, I guess the app is designed to just talk back when it hears something. However, I got chills when I told the app, if you're a ghost, don't talk for ten seconds. Exactly ten seconds later, I hear a loud ah. I immediately closed the app. When I have the courage again, I'll record it this time. Can someone else explain what the gimmick is? Was it a coincidence? I don't really want to think there's a ghost in my apartment as I live alone. I will say, as a somewhat tech-savvy person, all of the ghost apps, for the most part, are, uh, well, it's fooling you a little bit. I am by no means saying that ghosts aren't real. However, 
generally speaking. If there's a little radar on there, it's tracking like a, uh, an electronic signal. Maybe it's your router, maybe it's a telephone pole, something like this. And the dot will get closer to you. When it gets close, it will prompt one of a hundred and some, or some odd other <clears throat> sounds that will then shoot out at you. Normally they're, you know, non-distinct sounds. If you've ever used an actual EVP, it's much less obvious than this. This is just a little cash grab. Don't be scared of that one. My scariest experience. I'm 29 years old and this happened when I was about 10. It does need some backstory because my childhood was very paranormal centric in a way. My mom and I have always been horror movie fans. Can't even remember far enough back to a time when I didn't like horror. We also live in Jacksonville, Florida, which is about a 45 minute drive from St. Augustine, the oldest city in the US and probably also the most haunted. All of this naturally progressed into us becoming very interested in the paranormal. So much so that my parents formed a ghost hunting team when I was about nine. I wasn't allowed on the big investigations, but I was allowed to see some really cool places. One house we used to go to often was in Blackshear, Georgia, and the family there became lifelong friends even when they moved to Kentucky. They even got an episode on dead files. I have so many great memories from those days that I'll probably never forget them. One of the scary memories is, well, one I'll also never forget. My parents and I went on a trip to California because my dad had to go for work and we all went. While he was doing his meetings, my mom and I visited Disneyland and it felt like a fun vacation. One evening during that trip, the three of us went on a ghost tour at the Queen Mary. I don't remember much of that tour because it was a little boring. Mostly the tour guide, like knock once for yes, two for no kinds of questions. That was in the haunted areas. The stories were fascinating, and the energy there was extremely sad and depressing for me. One of the stops on the tour was like a first-class swimming pool, and it's attached to a dressing room, which essentially just looked like a public bathroom with stalls and no doors. This area had the worst energy of the whole ship, but there was supposedly some kind of mean trickster spirit that hung out around there. I think I experienced that spirit when we were in there. We were in the dressing room and the tour guide decides to try something. She had one person go into each of the stalls of the dressing room. She told everyone to turn off all the flashlights and cameras and just sit there and see what might happen. As soon as the room went black, within a few seconds something grabbed my upper arm and exhaled into my ear. I felt the warmth scared me to death, pun intended, so much so I immediately yelled and came running out with lights and just turned back them on and, well, I just cried for my mommy. I've heard recently that around the same time as when they blocked off that area and stopped doing tours there as well, but, well, I don't think something that happened to me would have caused it. Can't help wondering if either it was my experience that made them stop tours into there, or that something like that happened to others and they decided to close it up for safety reasons. I know this is stuck with me even today. I watch a lot of paranormal investigators on YouTube and I watched one where somebody was able to get into the first class pool and I could feel that energy again. It felt like I almost had a panic attack. Terrifying encounter for me and I vowed to never go back there again but I think I may do it for a sense of closure. I don't know if I'll get the chance to, but it would be interesting. I'm being haunted, I think. Okay, to start with, I don't really believe in the paranormal for most of my life. This changed when I met my girlfriend. 
She says she's dealt with the paranormal all of her life, that she even has a ghost haunting from her young age. At first I thought, oh, I'm sure it's just the warped memory of a child. But after some time with her, I've come to believe it. We had all these weird occurrences while we were together. Things like stuff falling over out of nowhere, but one that was extremely creepy that we couldn't explain at all. Well, we were in a hotel room. We were just sitting there on the bed eating and watching TV when we heard her water bottle, which was closed tightly. It started unscrewing itself and the cap flew off. Neither of us could believe what we had just seen or heard, just kind of laughed it off. Now up until recently we had been kind of long distance dating, and this spirit has only ever done things to show its presence while we were together. Well, now I live closer to her in an apartment about 30 minutes away. Every few months, and only whenever she's not there, I'm visited by this presence while either asleep or close to it. The first time was a few months after I'd moved in. I was sleeping, but something felt different. I started to stir a bit, and I felt this presence outside of my room in the kitchen and thought I heard talking. But my roommate wasn't home. He was visiting family. Thought I heard my cat dash under the bed as well, but suddenly the presence started getting closer, and the hairs on my neck and arms started to stand, and I got extremely cold. It sounded like it was trying to talk to me as it got closer. When it felt like it touched me, I jolted awake and finally opened my eyes after keeping them shut out of fear. There was nothing there. Not my roommate, nor my cat. My cat was under the bed, though. Another time was a very similar experience, only this was more malicious. Instead of talking and coming closer, it felt like the presence was creeping in and I woke to what felt like cold stabs into my stomach. My girlfriend was on FaceTime with me asleep at the time. I woke her up and just, excuse me, I woke her up and told her about it and she freaked out. The most recent time was only less than a few weeks ago. The presence showed up while I was asleep, but this time was slowly walking toward me trying to just kind of talk to me, I think. They slowly touched me, but after the last time, what happened with the stabbing feeling and the creeping, I freaked out and I started screaming with my mouth closed and jolted awake. Once again, I was on call with my girlfriend and told her about it. She says she needs to sage the apartment in case there's a spirit, but I think there might be more than one, given the nature of the visits. Also, Another thing that's happening is that the thermostat in our apartment randomly and greatly fluctuates between 51 and 90 degrees when my roommate and I keep it at 72. He hasn't felt anything, but I'm not sure he's a believer in these kinds of things anyway, so I don't think he'd tell me if he did. Any thoughts? My Pops Mylar Balloon I have a quick story to share with you all that you might appreciate. My Pop died in our local hospital back in 2002 after a long fight with colon cancer. In his room when he died, there were some items that we sort of brought to cheer him up, and we thought maybe he might get better. Among those items was a Mylar balloon in the shape of a big yellow smiley face. After he passed... We brought all of his personal items home and put them into his room, which used to be a downstairs family room that we converted when he moved in. A few days after he passed, my mom and I were in her room, and she was crying, and I was trying to console her. I know you don't know me, and I could totally be making this up, but I swear, while we were both sitting on the end of her bed, his smiley face balloon now nearly deflated. It drifted into her bedroom, and bumped her leg. We were both stunned. The balloon traveled from the family room up a half flight of stairs, turned left through her kitchen, then turned left again and went up a second half flight of stairs to the bedroom hallway, again, making a left turn into the bedroom while we were sitting. There were no windows open, and the house isn't any draftier than any other house I've lived in. There was no discernible moving air. We all know that Pop was telling us to be happy, 
I haven't thought about it. Unknown entity on the back roads. This happened eight years ago, almost to the day, and I was living in one city and working in another city about 20 minutes away. Since then, the areas between have been hugely developed, but at the time, everything between these cities was just underdeveloped back roads with nothing around. No buildings, no sidewalks, no lights. Just rough old roads until you get into the other city. To get to work on time, I had to leave my house at 3.30 a.m. One morning, I jolted awake at 3.20, full of adrenaline, as I realized I had only 10 minutes to get myself ready and set my dog up to be alone while I was at work. Needless to say, the circumstance had me highly alert, rushing and focused. Also, I was driving a lot faster. I drive down this road every day as I went to work. I usually take that time to wake up, but this time I was wide awake. All I could think about was what would happen if I ended up being late. I was really anxious, and suddenly my headlights shone upon something in the distance ahead of me. What I saw was a naked, skinless man crossing the road on foot. And when I say skinless, imagine those diagrams in your life science classes, like everything beneath the skin revealed and intact. Except in this case, with a shiny slash wet appearance. Bright pinks and reds all over. Like a living, skinless person. No clothes, no shoes, and notably appearing oddly content. He seemed strangely at ease considering he was crossing the road into nothingness. And this was in front of a speeding car in the dark at 3.45 a.m. There was no walking space suitable for humans out there for miles. The area he was walking into was pitch black. Nothing there but weeds and rocks. The direction he was coming from, the same. No light, nowhere to roam, nothing. Was I tripping or what? I was sober, super awake. I saw a shapeshifter. So I was sitting in my car facing an alleyway in a downtown area. Midday, I watch a black cat stroll into a bush. Mind you that it was a small, thin hedge, maybe three feet tall and two feet wide in a corner of a building, against two walls. Out of the same damn hedge exits an older white male in all black, sneaking out, holding his hands to his chest, curled up like you would be, imitating a cat with a fish held between its teeth. I locked my car and just watched as he kept sneaking with the fish in his mouth until I couldn't see him anymore. Now, I've seen crackheads before, and this is very similar behavior to someone out of their mind, but there's no possibility that a tall, lanky man would fit in that hedge. I just saw footage of a similar event, but you can see the transformation happen in seconds on camera, which reminded me of what I saw recently. So, now I'm here. Welcome. I can't be the only one who's witnessed something like this. Doppelganger or what? Throughout high school, I worked at a grocery store from ages 15 to 18. I got my driver's license at 16, like most kids where I live, and when I was 18, I'd left the job. I'd come home the next summer on my university break, and I was in the store shopping when my manager came up to me and let me know that she had found my driver's license in the back of the store the previous week on the ground and returned it to me. I was so wildly confused, as I knew I had my ID because, well, I'm a college student who goes out to bars every weekend, and I hadn't worked there in about a year. 
I checked when I got my car, and well, it was an exact duplicate driver's license that I already had. So, I had two. While I was in university, I had to update my license to the full graduated one. And I opted to take a new one, and it was like the same photo that one of my old boss gave me, so it wasn't my old one that I had when I worked there. My university was an eight-hour drive from my hometown, and there would have been no way the license would have been mailed to my high school job, as well as me at uni. Really weirded me out. It was so odd that my manager didn't think it was weird either. I ended up giving it to my sister, who was only 16, because she wanted it to boot booze from her and her friends, but she was even too creeped out to use it. I think we burned it the next time I came home. Would that be some weird paranormal thing, or am I crazy? For some reason, it really impacted my sister, and we're quite a bit older now, but she still brings it up every now and then and speaks about how off-putting the whole thing was. I heard the name of someone who used to live in my home. I recently bought my first home, but being on a budget, we had to settle for an older home. It was built around 1951 and the whole neighborhood was built around the same time frame. During the home buying process, we worked virtually with a real estate agent as we were in an entirely different state. Come move in time, I could tell the house had an energy about it. Nothing necessarily malicious, just a sort of charge in the air that comes with a house 72 years old. As we begin to explore, we find an odd stuffed toy rabbit in the attic. My wife and I are both superstitious, so we both decide to leave the rabbit where it is and not touch it. Come several months, I begin thinking more and more about the rabbit for reasons unknown to me. Suddenly, a name pops into my head. Chester. Chester X. Name excluded to protect the previous homeowners. I think this is weird, and I tell my wife. She thinks nothing of it, just that it's a bit strange and jokes that they probably died on the property. I do a quick Google search, find a younger-looking man with the same name who lives in the same city, but think nothing of it. Why would I contact them just because of their name? Anyways, fast forward to a day ago, my wife tells me that while I'm at work, an older man approaches her while she was washing her car. She's friendly to him and says hi, but she's in no mood to talk. She resumes washing her car, but after a minute or so realizes he's still there. So she starts chatting with him. Turns out he grew up in this house. So he tells my wife all about it, and about how great it was to live in the house. She takes him to the backyard, and he tells us all about it. Everything from the fact that his dad built the shed that we have in the corner of our yard, to a little stone path I recently found and began excavating. And, oh, well, my wife is thanking him for his visit. She asks him what his name is. The next thing she told me sent shivers down my spine. His name is Chester. The Man in the Hat This is one of my earliest memories. If I had been alone when it happened, I would not have been confident enough to share it. This occurred when I was a young boy. My older brother was with me. We lived in Mexico City. We were born there. This event happened sometime after an 8.0 magnitude earthquake of 1985. This violent earthquake led to the deaths of over 5,000 people and several billion dollars worth of damage. This earthquake, its intense and wild destruction, is my earliest memory. At the time, we lived in an apartment building several stories up. The structure was just your run-of-the-mill housing unit commonly constructed out of concrete, brick, and wood. I recall how upon entering the unit, the dining area would be immediately to your right, the kitchen to your left. 
If you headed further inward, there was a terrace where my mom kept her plants, and my dad kept his dog. Beyond this area, the kids' room would be to your left, and my parents' room would be to the right. In between these two rooms was a living room with several windows looking out over the street. Our building was located at the corner of the building. This happened sometime around noon. My brother and I were playing in the living room with our toy cars on the windowsill. Our mom had just come in from watering her plants and had gone into her room. My dad was out. I recall looking out into the street, seeing several cars and people moving about. If I remember correctly, we were trying to recreate as accurately as possible the goings-on of the world below with our toys. We were situated near the corner of the window, my brother to my right, closest to the wall, when something strange caught my attention. A set of sturdy, unusually pale hands with long, dirty, claw-like nails were piercing the brick exterior of the building. Then a circular, flat, soot-covered black object came into view. This object appeared to be swaying from side to side with each climb. The flattened object slowly became elongated, tall, fanning out of the base. A hat. Gradually, and much to my confusion, I began to make out the features of a man, except that it didn't look like any man I had ever seen. Pale-faced, long-haired, with intense dark eyes. His face is the kind of thing you never forget. I bumped my brother with my elbow, his attention still diverted by the toy cars in his hand, his view partly obstructed by the wall. Mira, look, I remember saying to him. My brother looked up, his toy still in hand, and silence overtook the both of us. Expressionless, his gaze somewhere far away, the man stopped his ascent, then turned and looked directly at us. Still holding on to the facade of the building, his pallid face suddenly turned into a harrowing grimace of a smile. His teeth were sharp, fanged with a yellowish hue. His eyes glowed with an intensity that seemed out of place for something that was already out of place. Suddenly, the man brought one of his hands to his still outstretched smile, and with it, he signaled to us, Shh! Frozen in place, we stood there, watched him resume his climb. As he scaled the building, we noticed how tall he was. He was immense taller than most of the people you would encounter on any given day in this city. We also saw that he wore what looked to be a three- or four-piece black suit and a long coat. Quite distinctly, it was hard to ignore that he looked to be covered in humo smoke. Despite his warning, we ran and excitedly tried to get her mom to come with us to see the smoke-covered man. She hurried alongside us, opened the window, and looked out and up. If his goal was to climb to the top of the building, who the hell and what he was even doing there in the first place is beyond me. He still had several stories to go, yet no one was there. She called out to the street and shouted if anybody had seen anything. No were the answers from below. There was no immediate recall of what occurred following this event, only, well, that life felt a bit strange as if this person was something that we weren't meant to see. It was like being a child and thinking that you would get into trouble if you snuck up on Santa Christmas morning when you should be asleep. Except that this had an air of danger that my younger self felt was better left alone. Several years later we moved to another apartment in the city before eventually making it out to the United States, where a better life awaited us. Sometime around 97, we were all having dinner in our new house. We were still keeping the dinner hours that we were accustomed to in Mexico. So around 9 p.m. we all gathered at the table. We were having a pretty good time, smiling and carrying on, when my older brother abruptly stops laughing halfway through a joke. I thought he was choking, so I turned to look at him. He was ghostly pale, his eyes and mouth wide open. 
He lifts his hands and points directly to the living room beyond where the dining area and kitchen are. We all turn, now staring directly into the dimly lit darkness of the living room. I ask him what's wrong. He says, there's a really tall person standing there looking at us. What does he look like? I ask. His voice quieter than usual, shaking, replied. He's wearing a tall hat and a really long coat. I remember feeling like time stopped, immediately thinking of the man that we had seen several years before, scaling the side of the building we used to live in. It couldn't possibly be the same person. What does his face look like? I ask. I don't know, he said. It's all black, like a shadow. Something weird happened this morning. So I've got to stay in a hotel for a couple of nights for work. So yesterday I traveled to the hotel and there's a multi-story car park opposite the hotel. And if you're staying there, you can park there for free. So I park up and get my stuff. Some specialist tools I have are a few grand. So I don't like leaving them in my van. So basically I take them, my laptop, my overnight back with me, and so I'm carrying a fair bit of stuff. I'm parked on the top floor of the car park. I get to the staircase door and I think to myself, for fuck's sake, this is a bit heavy. Also carrying my stuff. So I look for a button on the side to automatically open it, but no button, fine. I finally get the door open, enter the staircase. There is a motion sensor. The lights in the staircase automatically turn on. So I get to my room, which looks out to the car park, and something keeps telling me to look at the car park. I don't know what it was, just a feeling. Anyway, I go to sleep. I wake up at 4 a.m. for work. That morning I wake up, shower, and get ready. For some reason, the car park comes into my head. I look out. A few seconds later, the staircase lights come on. No one to be seen. You can literally see the whole staircase. So I'm like, okay. The car park also has motion sensors. None of them are lit. I look at my watch. It's 428. Weird time to have automatic lights come on. Unlikely. Then the top door opens fully. No one there. Then it closes. Then it opens halfway and then closes again. And then it opens halfway and then it closes. At this point, I have a real hair-raising feeling. Goosebumps, if you like. I grab my phone, open the camera, push record, aim it at the staircase, and at the same second, my phone points at it. The light goes off. An angel or some sort of messenger. In 1999 or 2000, when I was 14, I was with my friend Carl skateboarding in Northport Village, New York. After a couple of hours, we decided to go to a deli to grab something to drink. We took our sodas outside and sat down on a bench in front of the deli, where a middle-aged man was also sitting. Carl and I were just making small talk, and I specifically remember I was drinking a grape soda. I was looking at the label and saw a warning that said something along the lines of, Warning. Contents under pressure. Cap may blow off. I'd never seen that warning before, and I found it amusing. I then mentioned it to Carl, and he also found it to be peculiar. Then, in an amused tone, the middle-aged man said something like, Does it really say that? So I showed it to him, and we all thought it was interesting. Whatever. The man then asked us if he could ask us something. We said sure. Even though this was a random encounter with a guy who looked like he was in his late 40s or early 50s, it didn't give off any creepy vibes. He asked us what religion we were, and where we went to church, if we went. 
It's not really important to the story, but Carl and I are both Catholic and attended Mass pretty regularly at St. Patrick's Church in Huntington, New York. Even though this was much more of an intense question, he asked it in the same light-hearted tone that he had kept with during the entire conversation. When you die and Jesus asks you, why should I let you into my kingdom? What are you going to say? We both basically gave the same answers. Saying that, well, we tried to be good people and tried to go to church. And for the record, my mother was a pretty strict Catholic at the time. Carl's family was not as religious, but he was still a believer. The man then told us that those were both pretty good answers, but what we have to say is because Jesus died for my sins. We both acknowledged him and said okay. Carl and I exchanged a few more pleasantries with him and started to walk down the street. I swear to you, we couldn't have been taken more than five or ten steps when Carl said, Watch, that dude be gone. So we both looked behind us and sure enough, that dude did be gone. Carl and I went looking for the man for probably the next 10 or 20 minutes, and we couldn't find him anywhere, and I can promise you that we were thorough. Walking on the stairs above me. When I lived with my parents here in the UK, I used to bathe quite late in the evening, 10 or 11 p.m., and usually had no issues or interruptions. For a bit of context, above the bathroom is a little corridor slash landing with doors to the two bedrooms that connects to some stairs that go to another corridor outside the bathroom in a sort of Z shape. So essentially, I heard creaking above me on the landing, which slowly moved down the stairs like someone was slowly walking. The stairs are noisy, by the way, since they're not well built. This continued for about five minutes as the noise kept moving down until the creaking reached outside the bathroom door, and then completely stopped. I was pretty uneasy as I was expecting to hear my parents complain or say something, but there was nothing. I eventually opened the door, and there was nothing there, no lights on or anything weird. And when I went upstairs to my parents, they were asleep, and their door was closed. Tap on the mirror at midnight. One day I was sleeping, when suddenly I woke up because of a loud noise. It was as if my mirror was being hit very hard several times. At first I thought it was my cat, but I illuminated my room with the light from my cell phone screen and my cat was sleeping on the other side of the room. My cat woke up went up to my bed so I could pet him, and so far everything was fine, but what scared me was that my cat was staring at my mirror. At that moment I left the room with my cat in my arms because I felt very scared. All this happened in like seconds, but I still remember it very well. It was 1.29 in the morning. The next day I walked into my room and saw some small handprints on my mirror. There were five in total in fact, but... You can only see three from a certain angle on my camera. The prints are not normal. They're smaller than my hand and the fingers are incomplete. I told all of this to my family and, well, we put a crucifix on the mirror, as well as praying for wandering lost souls. Every time we pray, the candle flame begins to shake strongly, even though there's no windows in my room. What reassures me is that the flame is also very high, and I think that's a good thing. That day I was talking to my mother after praying, and when she mentioned that we were going to pray every day, the flame began to shake strongly. Nobody wants to sleep in the room, it's been three days, and I still feel nervous. We don't know very well what to do. Please, if anyone has knowledge of these phenomena that can guide me, Thank you very much. I'm attaching images of my mirror before cleaning it. My gecko thanks you for that.
Was this a supernatural experience? About a year ago, I had my first paranormal experience. It wasn't exactly the first time I felt something, but it was the first time it was visual, and I could hear things too. First, I'd like to give some context to the story. I'm 22 years old, and my whole family has a somewhat connected history with the supernatural. I've heard various stories from both my grandmother and my mother. Especially my mother, who told me stories about her dreams and how she would talk to deceased relatives or receive messages. Despite this family history, I was never very quote-unquote spiritual. Okay, I had a few moments where I felt things, but I concluded that it was just my fear taking over my mind and making me imagine things that don't exist. However, Around June of 2023, I had two experiences that changed my perspective on all of this. The first one, which may not mean anything and could just be in my head, but after the second one, it made me think it might have been some kind of contact. I'm a university student and I study at night, often finishing quite late around 9.30 to 10 p.m. When I was coming back from class, going downstairs as I usually do, listening to music, I heard a voice call my name twice. I took off my headphones immediately and thought it might be a classmate trying to sell me something or tell me something. I don't know, I forgot. At that moment, I went up the stairs and when I reached the floor where my class was, I didn't see anyone there. I thought it was just my imagination, so I continued on my way home. A few days later, I was heading home again after class. I'd just gotten off the subway and was on the station overpass. This is when I saw a tall man in an overcoat pass by me. I remember observing the light that illuminated the overpass blinking repeatedly at that moment. He walked past me and out of curiosity I looked back. There was no one there. I tried talking to my cousin about these two events and he told me that our family has this spiritual side suggesting that maybe I've reached the age where these things are surfacing in me. He told me he had similar experiences when he was my age. I don't know how much of this is true and how much is just nonsense, especially the part about the family. My cousin is a bit out there and uses a lot of weed and other drugs. He's not crazy, but he gets a bit carried away with what he says sometimes. Was it demons? When I was a kid, maybe around 11 years old, we lived in a house and I shared a room with my sister who was 16 at the time. Nothing weird ever happened until one night when I was woken up from the blinds above my head by the window, sounding like they were being tapped on. Kind of got a little scared. I just put my head under the covers thinking it'll stop or just go away. The next thing I heard was my jewelry box over my dresser open and close. That was the moment I became absolutely terrified knowing my sister is next to me asleep in our room and the door is closed with no one else inside. I tried to wake my sister. But she was a bit of a jerk at that age toward me. She didn't wake up at all. I thought maybe I should just start praying. I was praying very hard and all of a sudden started hearing howling like as if an animal was in pain and becoming more and more distant. I remember this very vividly as I'm now 33 years old and will never forget this night. I moved out of that room the next day and never went in there again. I've never slept without a TV on either. And ever since that day I've had very many other encounters but nothing was as terrifying as this. Not sure if something's really been with me my entire life or if I'm sensitive to the feel and kind of hearing things around. Does anybody know if that howling could have been demonic or if anybody had rarely heard anything similar to this? Spooky Bathroom Here is a couple encounters that I've had in my bathroom that I will never shower in ever again. I always feel as if something is in the bathroom and it's down the hall from my room, 
and I can see it from my bed. This is the first bathroom. My other bathroom is in my room. No issues with that one. So here it goes. One night I was showering in there and I was closing my eyes and washing shampoo out of my hair when I heard my name being called and I thought it was my husband calling me from the living room. I started yelling from the shower. He didn't respond. Then I continued to shower well and the next time I closed my eyes. This calling was very close to my ear and more of a whisper. I was very scared and very freaked out. Got out immediately went to ask my husband if he had been calling me. But he had his headphones in playing games on his computer saying he wasn't calling me at all. Never heard me calling for him either. I've never heard anything calling my name or even talking. So that was the first well, out of all the experiences that I've had. But I'll never shower in there again. The second thing that occurred in there was my daughter was showering and had the door open. And like I said, I can see the bathroom from my bed, which is where I was sitting. All of a sudden, I start seeing the light dim and the door just slams. And you have to close that door pretty hard to shut it all the way because there's a rack to hang clothes on it. It slammed so hard it knocked the towel holder off the wall falling and just closing the light off on my daughter screaming. Ran to the door and couldn't open as if it were locked. That was the most disturbing occurrence in that bathroom my daughter was shaking. Finished washing her up got her the hell out of there. Now, I'm the hell out of here. See ya. Greetings, seekers of the paranormal. Welcome to Paranormal M, your source for all things mysterious and unexplained. Subscribe and turn on notifications. Drop a comment and stay informed about our latest investigations. We promise to keep you captivated with our eerie tales. Tennessee Civil War Fort In the summer of 2022, I decided to take a summer class at my university during this season. This was so I could complete some of my course credits early. I took U.S. History 1 as one of these classes. During this class, one of the projects that my professor assigned me was to go to any historical site in Tennessee. That's where my university is. And at that location, I would write a report about it and its historical significance. Coincidentally, I saw online that there was a previous fortress from the Civil War that was renovated into a local park around 15 minutes away from my university. This was perfect for me because it meant that I could just go after my class ended and get this project started early. So I went. At this park, everything was normal. It had normal things like a playground and some walking trails. And around the trails were some informational signposts about the war and how the fortress was utilized during that time. In the back of my mind, I was consciously aware of the fact that there was likely spirits around from that time. I didn't close myself off to this and tried to not feel fearful of this feeling. In fact, I felt like I opened myself up to anything I could have experienced. Anyways, I walked around, took a few pictures, and didn't see or feel anything strange. So I gathered all the information I needed and went home after. I think it was either that night or the night after this day that I first experienced something strange. As I was trying to go to sleep, I felt like I heard a name pop into my head. It wasn't a normal name to me either because it sounded very old-timey and bluntly white. I'm not white, so I don't have family members who would use this name. I actually didn't pay attention to this and just went to sleep without researching it because, I don't know, I don't know. I just didn't care enough to look into it because I thought it was strange enough that, well, I thought of this random name. Anyways, I woke up the next morning and remembered this weird sounding name, so I googled it out of curiosity. Turns out that this name that I heard, Clark Corbin, belonged to Henry Clark Corbin. 
he was a general at the Battle of Nashville. And that battle was in 1864, Tennessee for the Union side against the Confederacy. Thank God, in parentheses. I mentioned earlier that at the park there, there was informational signs of the Civil War, but I never saw his name on any of them. There were other names on them, but not his when I rechecked if I saw his name in passing, and that's how I thought of him. There was no info about him anywhere, which is why I think this was the spirit who contacted me. Whether it was the General Corbin himself or a private underneath him that was looking for him, I don't know, but regardless, it was a really cool and a bit spooky experience that added a lot of fun for me to my U.S. history class and project. I even told my professor about what happened and she seemed fascinated by it, wishing that she could have experienced something like it herself. I don't blame her because I'm a history nerd too, but I'm lucky that this was a positive experience and nothing too frightening like some of my friends and family, things that they've experienced. I think Mr. Corbin just wanted to be remembered, and he definitely gave me something to remember for life. Hiding Under the Table I lurk in the suburbs, but I'm always willing to share at least one story. Whenever I think about this event, I'm still shocked about what I saw. Whenever I tell it, I can't even believe it. I had never had anything like this happen to me. To give some context, my home at the time was like a ranch-style home. My family moved to this place when I was young, I'd say like 10 years old. When I moved in, I was scared to be alone at night. I felt like I was being watched and had super strange dreams. They were vivid dreams, too. So here's the layout. The living room and dining room together, and then there was a doorway into the kitchen. In the kitchen, there was a pantry with a sliding door. The space was creepy, and whenever the sliding door was open, that feeling of being watched intensified truly think this home was haunted. I must have been about 12 at this time that this happened. And there was a table in the home at the time that my dog would sit under. He was getting older, so I went to check on him. After checking on him and seeing that my dad was asleep on the couch, I sat with my dog under the table. I know this is weird, but I was a weird kid. The TV was off and there was no noise going on. I plugged in my headphones and played some music. I was rubbing my dog's head and he lifts his head up. I look up and take out my headphone. In front of me and my dog was a figure. It was strange. It was as if there was surprise on both ends. It looked like walking TV static. I could barely make out eyes, but I felt like it was looking at me. It turns and it fades away. I jumped out from under the table and ran to my dad. He was now awake and at the time, he hadn't seen it. And later on, he would tell me that he did see it. I was told to ignore it, apparently. I really couldn't think of a logical explanation as to what I saw, and I don't know why it was static, or why that this element of surprise was there. When I think of that part of it, it's kind of silly. I had the feeling of being watched and my family would move away years later. And I have not had anything like this happen to me again. Did I receive an omen? I don't want to call it a shadow figure because I don't really know what it was, but... All I can say is that I feel a presence behind me, the same way you can feel when someone is approaching you from behind. And I saw a black figure in my peripheral. What do I believe, or I guess while I do believe in the paranormal, I've never had anything happen in my presence, so I don't know what to make of it. I was really freaked out by it because it felt more like an omen than anything. 
I can see stuff in my peripheral all the time, and so I usually dismiss stuff like this. Except my co-worker, who I was talking to when it happened, they had also seen it. We were standing there having a conversation when I saw a figure in the black just sort of pop up over my right shoulder. I didn't think anything of it, just thought another co-worker was trying to squeeze behind me to get by. I could feel their presence from one side going all the way toward the other side, exactly like somebody trying to get by. So I leaned forward a bit and then looked over my left shoulder to see who had squeezed behind me, but no one was there. Thinking somebody was playing a prank on me, I quickly turned to look back the other way. Not a single person had tried to walk by. I looked back at my co-worker I was talking to, and without me saying a word, he said, I saw it too. He wasn't freaked out like I was, though. I started to explain what I saw, to make sure we really saw the same thing, and he said, almost like someone wearing a black hoodie. That's exactly what it was like. It didn't feel malevolent or threatening, just a presence. Again, I've never experienced anything like it, and this had actually happened not even an hour into the new year. I worked night shift, so we were working during the flip into the new year. Which led me to think that it was an omen. Later that night after I got home from... I just... Large chunk of my problem tooth broke off. I have a tooth I need to get pulled, a molar that never cut, so it ended up growing in wrong. Now I can't imagine I had this massive, to me, experience of a possible open happen just to tell me my tooth is about to chip. I don't know, knock on wood, but nothing has happened since, good or bad. I think I've seen a shadow or a thing or a person twice my life, but I'm still skeptical on the paranormal and can't quite explain it. So the first story I was around five. I'd say I was either four or five, at most six. The year was somewhere around 2010. I used to live in a department, and one night I was taking a bath by myself upstairs while my mother and sister were downstairs. After I finished my bath, I got out of the tub and put my towel on, and as I was standing in the bedroom, I was looking out in the hallway, inside of the hallway, I could clearly and visibly see a shadow moving from the bathroom into my sister's room, where it seemingly walked out to my sister's door and disappeared. The strange thing is, is what it looked like, because it was what I used to call the finger man. It looked like when you take your hand and pretend to make a walking motion with your pointer and middle finger pointed down, you know? I was so scared and confused by what I said, but I just remember running down the stairs, asking my mom and sister if they were just upstairs, which they weren't, and they laughed at me after describing what I saw. Later in life, when I was in my house years after it moved from the apartment, around 2012-2013-ish, I was getting ready for school one day, and as I was in my room, I remember I could very clearly see a very long shadow arm reaching in from the hallway. It knocked down one of my hats I had hanging on my wall. I know I wasn't dreaming or imagining things because I very clearly saw my hat laying on the floor. I then went down the hall to my parents' bedroom where the door was shut, and after I knocked and my mom opened it, I asked her if she was in the hall and knocked over my hat. She was obviously confused and said no. I just went back to my room confused myself and a little scared. The weird thing is, years later, around eight months ago, my mom and grandmother were visiting me in North Carolina since I'm in the Marines and I was doing infantry training while I was on 96. That's a four-day weekend. And the topic of ghosts came up. Especially since we were watching those shows, and well, I brought up that story again, and my mother mentioned that in the original apartment that we lived in, my sister supposedly also had encounters in her room, and was just generally creeped out. 
And my grandmother added that when she stayed the night there, she stayed in my sister's room and felt the same feeling. I can't exactly remember everything she was saying, but I think she may have mentioned hearing a growl and getting scratched, too. But again, it's been eight months. I don't remember everything they mentioned, but they did in fact claim weird things to happen in my sister's room, which is the same room the shadow figure I saw stopped at and disappeared. So still don't really know exactly what I was encountering, but I haven't seen anything after that. And I am still skeptical to the paranormal. I even went to the Saratoga Sanitarium, which is supposedly one of the most haunted places in Saratoga. Nothing's happened there, and I've been to supposedly haunted places before and had nothing happen. The Girl from the Ring When I was in 7th grade, I believed but didn't believe in ghosts. So I did an experiment to see what would happen, and I regret it to this day. So to start off this traumatizing story, one night I decided to search up rituals to do so I could see if I had some kind of experience. I don't remember the exact ritual I did, but I do remember all the lights must be off that are visible and it must be dark outside. Then I did it, and immediately after I finished I began disrespecting whatever may be out there. You aren't real. Show yourself. Don't be a pussy. And do something, bitch. And almost right after I went silent, the temperature dropped and I got chills so fast. I immediately ran and turned the lights on and ran upstairs because it scared the hell out of me. About four hours later by this time, I forgot what I did, and when I went downstairs to get ready for bed because I had school the next morning, I was kind of skipping down the stairs casually and I jumped across the tiny hallway. To my right, to my peripheral vision, I see a dirty white dress, bluish pale bare feet and arms half covered long black hair covering her face and she was hovering i tell you she was hovering at least three inches off the ground too it also kind of looked like she was hunching her back anyway as i realized what i had just seen i bolted to the bed and jumped under my blanket so fast and covered my face I slept with the light on i was too terrified to even look the temperature dropped super cold again, and I had to lay there all alone in the basement by myself. The story doesn't end here. My dream it was almost as if I woke up and looked at the doorway into the other room, and she was looking back at me. For some reason, I wasn't scared of her and approached her. She was friendly, and I asked her if she was hungry, and she kind of shook her head yes, and magically I pulled out nachos. But she shook her head no, and then again I pulled out raw meat, and she started devouring it. Then I woke up. It was time to get ready for school, and like everyone else, when I first woke up, I forgot what I dreamed about. As I was putting my socks on half awake, I heard a whoosh. Looked up very fast, like what the fuck. And then I felt the gust of wind hit me like something just passed the hallway really fast, and then it hit me thought about what happened the night before and boom just like that my heart sank it got cold immediately my heart was pounding so i started speeding getting ready so i can get the hell out of there and then again whoosh, and i saw something go by very quickly i sat there silently in shock and scared as hell and stared at the hallway just waiting for something to happen again and after just a few seconds, a little red ball, I'm not even joking, straight out of a horror movie. I was in disbelief until I heard it thud and hit against the wall. I didn't know what to do. Then I heard my neighbor honking. They took me to school every morning. I hurried and flipped my jacket inside out, put the hood over my face to avoid having to really see anything, and ran up the stairs and out the door. When I got home, my dad stayed home sick. So, he asked. 
or rather I asked, excuse me, and he said, I don't know, I just woke up to get ready and when I went to the bathroom, I started throwing up dramatically. I must have blacked out because I woke up lying in puke. Heard someone walking around, but when I got up, no one was home. Then I told him what happened and he was in shock. We proceeded to bless the house with scriptures from the Bible and I felt a lot safer, but still felt like something was watching me. But never had another encounter with her for the next four years, until one day with my girlfriend, who I never told about, mostly because nobody believed me. We were getting fast food late at night and randomly, she says, there's a creepy looking girl standing by that tree behind us. And I didn't even have to look to know. I asked her to give me a description and she gave me the exact description of her. It was definitely her. And that's my scary experience. We've seen her twice since then, but it's always out of town, not by where it first happened. And who knows? I may see her again eventually. A ghost slash entity that was flaming magenta. I've had many ghosts or experiences with even things other than entities before, but this one in particular stuck with me and been in my mind ever since it happened about six months ago. I was going to a friend's house after we had agreed to hang out. It was a big house, one of those old 1800s kind of houses, dead center of town almost. I had a key, so I let myself in because I figured she was upstairs on the third floor and wouldn't hear the front door if I knocked. I called her name. No answer on the first floor, so I began to walk upstairs to the second floor where I could hear, where, well, where she could be hearing me more clearly. And I heard something, and it sounded like a woman was quietly talking on the phone in one of the bedrooms on the second floor, the one that I was now on currently. So naturally, I assumed that my friend was behind one of the nearby closed doors and that I didn't want to be rude. I figured she knew I was there, but was finishing up a phone call and needed a minute. So I sat on the ground against one of the hallway walls, directly looking at the closed door of the room I thought that she was in. Directly looking at the bottom of the door, there was enough space between the door and the floor to see shadowed footprints move from left to right and from right to left. I assumed they were hers. She was still sort of just talking on what I thought was a phone as I watched the set of shadowy footprints turn into two pairs. I had seen four shadow feet, two pairs, and they walked side to side on the floor. I suddenly thought, or maybe she isn't on the phone, maybe she's talking to someone in there. She's not alone in the room. Still, I didn't want to be rude and interrupt, especially if another person was in there with her. Then it happened. A loud smack of a hand hit the floor underneath the door, still behind it. It wasn't a shadow of a hand, it was a real hand, only a pale magenta color. I had seen smack its palm onto the floor underneath the door. It had to be directly behind the door for me to see it as plainly as I did. Like it was definitely meant for me to be startled and pay attention. The pale magenta color startled me more than the loud smack. It almost looked like the steam that comes off your skin when you get out of a hot shower. But bright magenta. Somewhat matching the pale magenta of its skin. Then a crooked scream of a face peeked through the space between the door and the floor, looking directly at me with this hateful expression of a silent scream. It was not my friend's face. It was the face of a woman I did not know. There was no sound, not even the talking I'd heard before, but it felt like I could feel the scream this face was making and hear it in a weird, silent sort of way. Hard to explain. And it was directly at me. Its eyes were like normal eyes, except they were almost a blaze in appearance, and the pupils were huge, surrounded by hot pink magenta irises. They were pissed. Its hair looked like the hair of Lava Girl. 
skin a pale magenta, terrifying magenta eyes, and her skin looked steamed. I jumped up, scared as fuck at what I had just clearly seen as plain as day, ran downstairs. I ran into my friend who was coming up the stairs from the first floor while I was running down them from the second. Meaning that she was never behind that door in the first place. And why didn't she answer when I called her in the first, you know, but, well, don't know. But she did believe me. A lot of weird things had been seen in this house over the years, but that did little to comfort me. Still, I think about this experience, and what does it mean? What was it? It was human in appearance, minus the monochrome magenta and seemingly fiery look. Why was it silently screaming at me? Why did it smack its hand down like that? What the actual fuck? I don't believe in ghosts. However, one afternoon I was home alone. My wife was out running errands. I spent a lot of time home alone, so it wasn't unusual in any way. I was sitting up in my room on my computer, as I often was, and I was scrolling through social media or watching videos, and I heard my wife come in the front door. It sounded like she was carrying some plastic grocery bags from shopping. This was a pretty common, ex you know, occurrence as she loves making excuses to get out of the house and I'm more of a homebody. I got the notification on my phone that the kitchen had sensed movement. The door in the kitchen leads out into our entry hallway so you can see people pass by the kitchen door as they cross the hall. Then the living room camera alerted shortly after. Again, nothing unusual. We have kids, so we set the cameras up in the family areas to keep an eye on them especially when they play video games and such. They also come in handy when the kids get in arguments or try lying to us. They also allow us to speak to them if we run errands and leave the home alone. They're older. So after taking note of the alerts, I kept scrolling away, awaiting my wife to come upstairs to the bedroom. After about 20 minutes or so, I couldn't hear her, and the motion alerts had stopped. The feeling you get when someone is in your house. Well, that feeling was gone. I listened closely, but couldn't hear anything. Babe? I called toward the stairs. But there was no response. I got off the bed and started down the steps, calling for her as I went. There was no response. I checked all the rooms and was puzzled that she wasn't there. I knew for certain I had heard her and I definitely felt her presence in the house. I stepped outside to see if she had run back to the car for something, but her car wasn't there. Now I was really puzzled, but I eventually arrived at the conclusion that she had forgotten something and ran back to town. Thought it was strange she didn't come up or say anything, but maybe she had thought I was napping. I made my way back up the stairs and decided I would give her a call. I called up her cell phone and when she picked up I asked her where she had went. She said she was still out running errands. I asked, why didn't you come up and see me when you stopped by a minute ago? She replied, what do you mean? I've been gone for only a couple of hours. What? You were down there for like ten minutes. I heard you come in carrying bags. There was emotional alert and everything. I swore it was you who the hell else would come in. There was a pause as we both considered this. She started to get worried and said I should check all the cameras and I agreed and told her I'd call her back shortly. Now my heart was starting to pound a little bit. Who the hell came into my home and why did they walk in and then leave? Had they taken anything? Was this the first time and were my children safe here? Nervously, I pulled up her motion cameras on the phone and started to scroll through the kitchen footage to just well, before I walked down the steps. I pressed play on the recording and waited. I heard a slam and a few knocking sounds like someone was coming inside. Then the grocery bag noises started. Now my heart was really pounding. Someone had definitely come inside and I was about to watch them stroll through my home. 
As I leaned in closer to the screen, a dark shadow suddenly loomed into view and crossed my entry hallway past the kitchen door. I could make it out as plain as day as it passed by. I was in complete disbelief. What in the hell was that? The camera was slightly distorted from it. It didn't really have a shape that was recognizable. It was just a shadow, shapeless cloud. I switched to the living room camera and played it again. Same noises, only this time I watched in full view as the shadow came from the hallway into the center of the living room. Then the entire room went dim on the camera. This was mid-afternoon. Were the cameras messing up? No. I had heard and felt someone in my home. I've been here ten years and have never been wrong. What was this thing? The scariest part? Just as I came down the stairs on the recording, the room lit back up again like normal. It was like a sunny day when a dark cloud rolls over and your whole room goes dim. Only there was not a cloud in the sky that day. Never been more terrified in my life as I was sitting in that house alone watching the footage of me walking down the stairs towards whatever the hell it was that I saw. I watched it over and over in disbelief and I knew I had heard somebody walk into my house. I felt their presence. There was no question in my mind that my wife had come home. Only she hadn't. It was just noises and a strange shadow. I've never once been one to be afraid of doors moving, strange noises, or thoughts that somebody in my home was there when there wasn't. I've always been able to tell when somebody comes into my home from the familiar sounds and feeling. In fact, it's never happened since. I called my mom I was so freaked out. I explained what happened and showed the footage. She shrugged it off, as did my wife, and in hindsight... I guess it wasn't really much to see. Some noises and a weird shadow. Easily explained away with logic when he didn't have a feeling of knowing someone was there to accompany it. But to me, it was the most terrifying experience and the closest encounter I'd ever experienced myself. I don't believe in ghosts and I never really have, but I know something or someone was in my home that day. Helped soul pass on. I feel I have medium abilities, but I do not encourage contact. I've had multiple contacts with spirits separated by five to ten years on average. One was terrifying when I was younger. I'm not at all frightened now. Some spirits are quite unpleasant and present is scary. Some spirits are quite unpleasant and present as scary. Hmm. But we all have the ability to banish unpleasant entities by insisting they leave and calling on your higher powers for help. Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, Christian. The higher power is the same. It's there for all. The more you embrace your spiritual, the stronger your personal protection abilities. I had a suicide victim follow me home. Somewhat recently, I was in a state forest on a trail motorcycle. I stopped to enjoy the nature. Looking up a steep canyon, I saw a ball of smoke about the size of a football floating through the trees. The smoke didn't roll or change shape as it floated. I watched it float directly heading toward me. It got very close to the ground, floated over my feet, rose up to eye level and disappeared. I got a vision of a grizzled old guy that looked rough, kind of homeless. I was sure I was contacted. I asked my guides to make him leave, but he didn't leave. Later at my home, the knocking started, and he did it frequently, knocking sounds on the wall and the ceiling. I tried to make him go with the prayers of protection, but what I got was a mental picture of what he was like. An unpleasant pest that annoyed everybody. A person anyone would avoid. 
I did some internet research on the forest, and I found an older man my age that had hung himself near to where I saw the smoke. And now he was in my home. One morning as I awoke, he spoke quite audibly right into my ear. I couldn't understand what he was saying, but I did understand that he was very confused and wanted help. He was relieved that I could hear him. I took a different approach. I prayed and asked for guidance on how to help. Furthermore, I told the higher power the next morning when I awoke I would say exactly what came to my mind. The next morning, I didn't think about it. I just said what came to my mind, which was, I forgive you. God forgives you. It's now time for you to forgive yourself. Although you are afraid, your family loves you and wants you to come home. A very brief but sincere statement. It worked. Over a few days, the vision of him became more peaceful, less grizzled, and the environment became much lighter And he went home. I disappeared. When I was in junior high school, I was a member of a gang. Nothing like what you see in movies, just a bunch of dumb white kids sneaking around late at night causing fairly innocent mischief. One night we were wandering around random neighborhoods, and it was probably between midnight and 1 a.m. We came across a large party full of high school teenagers. They were drinking and yelling and playing loud music. One of the members of our gang began mouthing off, shouting obscenities at them, and suddenly they were chasing us down the street. Most of my friends jumped fences or scattered into neighboring yards, but myself and another member ran down the middle of the street. It was fairly dark, but there were street lights and a lot of ambient light. The largest group of parties were chasing us, and something inside me told me to stop and stand still. I knew I couldn't outrun them as they were quickly gaining on us, so I stopped. The entire group of guys ran right past me. Several of them within a foot of me and tackled the person I was running with. They roughed him up quite a bit, and I and they asked him his name. I heard everything that was said, and I watched everything they did. I was waiting for them to turn on me next, but they never did. Instead, they finished with him and they walked back up the street right past me. Not one of them looked at me, even though I was literally standing in the middle of the street no less than a few inches from them. I waited until they passed, and then I walked over to my friend to help get off the ground, and he was shocked to see me. He asked me where I went. I told him I was standing there the whole time. He insisted I wasn't. He said he was running with me for a second, and I was just gone the next. I recited the whole conversation, and he was incredulous. He insists I was nowhere to be seen, and I've always wondered how this was even possible. Has anyone else ever heard of or experienced anything like this? Is this weird? Okay, so I kind of believe in ghosts, but also kind of don't believe. Like I would say I'm a 5 out of 10 believer. Anyways, my grandma, who I was very close to, passed on November 18th of last year, 2023, in case anyone is reading this years from now. She passed on a Saturday afternoon. I'm a 14-year-old girl and a freshman in high school. My mom is a teacher at my same high school, and it's not as bad as it sounds. So, on Friday at around noon, my mom gets a call saying that my family has moved my grandma to comfort care. For anyone who doesn't know, comfort care is pretty much care for people about to pass away. They set up a morphine trip so it doesn't hurt and just try to make them feel as comfortable as possible. My mom, obviously being extremely upset, took me out of class and we left school early. We live in a different state than the rest of my family, so we couldn't go visit grandma because we couldn't afford plane tickets. My mom can't drive by herself. 
but my mom still wanted to be at home when my grandma's passing happened. Anyways, me and my mom got cozy in the living room, tried to lighten the mood by throwing on some TV, and pretty much just waited. At around 7.30pm the same night, I was heating up some food in the microwave and I was just standing at my kitchen counters just waiting for my food. When I closed my eyes to blink, I saw the number 214. I opened my eyes and I was weirded out why I randomly saw that number but just brushed it off as nothing. So everything was fine the rest of the night and when I woke up Saturday morning, I was happy my grandma didn't pass during the night. But I had just had a gut feeling. I knew something was off. I tried staying awake with my mom, but at around 1.30 I fell asleep. An hour or two later, my mom woke me up with the, new, well, with the news that my grandma passed. I was fucking heartbroken, and me and my mom cried the rest of the day. And somehow we scraped together enough money so we could fly to Nevada, where the rest of the family lives. That was for her funeral. This is where shit gets kind of weird. Throughout the trip until I'm about to tell you, the number 214 kept popping up in my head, and I would just ignore it. Anyways, at her funeral, we were talking to my aunt, who had been taking care of my grandma for a year before she died, and who stayed the entire month my grandma was in the hospital. My aunt told me that my grandma kept saying, I do not want to pass in front of my kids. I refuse to do it when any of them are in the room. Then she said that at around 2 p.m. she left the room and left my grandma alone. She said she was only gone for 15 to 20 minutes when she got the... Well, she got news that she had passed. Then she told me that once she got everything figured out, my grandma's exact time of death was 2.14 p.m. I have more to say regarding my grandma's death, but it's nothing too crazy. Anyways, is that weird? Yeah, kinda. I mean, I just feel that the time 214 kept just popping in my head and she died at that exact time. But is it just a weird coincidence? Am I just overthinking all of this? I just kinda need a second opinion. Also, sorry for the long ass post, I have a bit of ranting. Well, a habit of ranting. George, our cigar-loving, frugal, otherworldly house resident. In about 2010, my little family lived in a small town in Victoria. We lived in an apartment, little sort of unit complex where older people had lived, and it had suddenly become available for rent. We had been in a domestic violence situation, so seven months pregnant me and my two children at the time had moved into this little apartment. My teenager lived in a room that had a window bordering a large garden that we shared with all the units. So often her room would be quite messy, so I'd go and tidy it up a bit. I would also smell the smell of cigarettes, or what I thought was cigarettes but ended up being stronger, more like cigar smoke. I spoke to her about it, and to this day, and she's now 25, she is adamant that she never smoked at all until she was 17, and hated it. And it was very often, honestly. I actually got to the point where I searched her room thinking there were going to be cigarettes in there, like I stripped it, and there were never any cigarettes anywhere at all. So then, we also had some occurrences where, I mean, at the time, we were all girls, so leaving the toilet seat up never really happened for us. But the toilet seat would regularly be left up. And after asking everybody, which consisted of a toddler, nappies, a fastidious teenager, and me, it seemed completely impossible that we had been leaving the toilet seat up so regularly. Like a few times, maybe after cleaning it to let it dry. But every single day... Not at all. We also regularly had the kettle, microwave, and television turned off at the wall. We'd be sitting there hearing the kitchen door open and then the click of the switches one by one. We would often have lights switched off and it seemed like somebody was taken care of, like 
I suppose maybe our electricity bills, thinking that we were leaving things on too much. But also just that continuous sort of waft of cigar smoke. So we had a plumbing issue one time. Had a plumber person that had been servicing the apartment for years. I came out and asked him straight out. Was there anybody who lived here who smoked cigars that you know of? And he laughed and said, Uh, that'll be George. I immediately got some chills down my spine and I asked him, What do you mean? And he said, Well, George was a younger guy who moved to the area and worked as a mechanic for a long time. He eventually moved to these little apartments when his wife had passed away. And he loved cigars. And he smoked them all the time. He ended up getting a lung disease, which eventually he passed away from. He had a terrible cough, but he was also extremely stingy. He didn't like to use his heater in the winter, and often the house would be very, very cold. Because he seemed to be like he didn't want to waste money on electricity. And that made sense to me, because often all of my surplus electricity appliances would be just switched off the wall. And that pervasive smell of cigarette or cigar smoke would just keep wafting around. But being in that particular bedroom that my teenager was using was a little bit more chilling in the fact that George had actually passed away in that room and was later found there by his family. So as well as being extremely sad, it was also a little bit spooky. And we came to just affectionately refer to him as George and when things got switched off we would say thank you. When there was a really strong smell of cigar smoke, we would ask him to smoke outside. And he would also, sort of, well, I guess we would also ask him to remember to put the toilet seat down. Spooky Boo in the Creepy Farmhouse Cupboard A long time ago when my daughters were quite young, and my teenager was about 14, we lived in what was very likely one of the first houses in that street, which was probably about 60 or 70 years old. It was so old, in fact, that the quarter of an acre block that we lived on had the house facing with the front door facing the backyard. The back door was facing the driveway, where we could just sort of park, and it was kind of back to front. Unfortunately, the owners had sold the house, and we needed to leave. We had secured another property, and we were almost finished packing everything into our moving van. It had all the usual farmhouse charm. It was beautiful. We loved it, too. One thing, though, was a storage-type cupboard. Up above the linen cupboard, I think it's quite common to have a bit of storage area high up in an older house. It was a small old wooden door with a very strong lock on it. It was very odd. We always felt a bit strange about it. But of course, being curious, we tried to open it many, many times. But it was completely jammed shut. My littlest daughter was and is extremely sensitive to lots of dark stuff. As well as just general mystical stuff. And she would have these interesting dreams where she would be what could probably be called having an out-of-body experience. She would travel to all different places and attend all different kinds of events, such as car accidents, hospital operations, bedsides of sick people, lots of strange things. She used, well, she used to be called Spooky Boo. So the last night before we were leaving, she woke up with a nightmare. She was only three, by the way. But she was having a really terrible nightmare about the cupboard opening. And when it opened, a long, dark, clawed hand appeared to be coming out of it. And that frightened her enough to be awake and screaming. It came to her straight away, cuddled her and comforted her, and she came into my bed that night. In the morning, we packed up the rest of our boxes and had one more look around before leaving. That's when my eldest daughter and I looked up and noticed that that cupboard was completely open. We immediately turned around and left, and we never went back. Still think of that farmhouse and all the fun that we had there. It was an amazing house. It had become a refuge for us, and we felt very free and happy there. But that never took away the chill that we felt when we thought of that strange cupboard.
there is a ghost cat living in my parents' house. Years ago, when I was 28, I was living at home and I experienced something that made a childhood mystery make sense for the first time. So I was laying in my bed with a chair and a footstool slightly to my right. I was scrolling on my phone when out of the corner of my eye, I see it get dark right above or on the chair. I look up to see the shadow of what looked like a cat turning in a circle and then jumping off the footstool. Just as you'd imagine a cat jumping off, same motion. And then it went under my bed. I don't know what came over me, but I looked under it to find nothing there. I sprint across the hall in my sister's room to see where her cat was, only to find him sitting with her. I told her what happened, pretty creeped out the rest of the night. I do think I saw it once more pass outside my door, but I can't confirm it had been my sister's cat that time, but it just felt like it wasn't. So as I continued to think about what I so clearly saw, I mean, sort of made me think about something that happened to my brother when we were younger. My sister was getting ready to paint her room and recruited her younger siblings to scrap tape and pull out the staples left behind. It was mainly left over by her 2000s posters, but anyway, my brother and I were just standing there, side by side, working. And that's when he starts screaming and runs downstairs. My sister and I are confused and follow him and find that he is a huge and very deep slit on the top of his foot. When my parents asked what happened, we couldn't give them any explanation because we truly didn't know. This was not just a scrape. He went over to the ER, which my parents were kind of nervous to do since they absolutely had no explanation, and ended up getting 12 stitches. It was an experience that all of us remember vividly because of how wild it was. It still bothers my brother a lot, really. He doesn't like talking about ghost cats, but my experience had me reflecting on that instance and how it makes sense that it could have been the ghost cat. It is said that paranormal activity increases when there are changes being made to their surroundings, which we were getting ready to paint low to the ground where a cat would be. A scratch, it was like a pretty clean cut. So since then, both my sister and dad have seen something out of the corner of their eyes, and my mom felt something brush against her leg while sitting at the kitchen table. My brother brought something home from prison. My oldest brother moved out when I was a little child. I can't even remember him living in our house. I live with my dad and sister. Anyways, he got into trouble with the law because of a domestic dispute involving drinking and his wife kicked him out. My dad is a saint, so he won't let him move back in with us. Everything was fine at first. The first few weeks we would play card games and talk and watch TV. Then it came time for him to be sentenced to go to prison. He only ended up spending two months there. But when he came back, he had an entirely different demeanor and energy. The only way I could describe it is his negativity and darkness. At first, you could chalk it up to him having a negative experience. But he would reminisce seemingly fondly about his experience and claim that it was no big deal. My sister and I are very spiritually sensitive, runs in the family on the female side. There were three distinct instances that solidified the idea that there was more going on than anything emotional or physical or birds. The first instance I was walking up the basement stairs and I heard footsteps at the top. I glanced up to see what looked like my brother crossing the threshold of the door frame. I could even tell you he was wearing blue jeans, a red polo shirt, and yellow Timberland-style boots. I walk upstairs and look around the corner, expecting to find my brother when my dad tells me he's actually two hours away in Buffalo. My dad and I were home alone, but he was wearing a blue shirt. The second instance, I had just fed the cats and decided to head upstairs to go to bed. 
I get halfway up the stairs before I hear a man's voice angrily yelling at me from the exact same place in the hallway where I saw the apparition. The third instance, my sister and I were pulling an all-nighter on the couch because I had a doctor's appointment in the morning. My sister says she has to go pee, so she gets up and walks towards the hallway and then immediately proceeds to turn around and sit back down. She starts facing the wall and crying. I ask her what's wrong, and she's hesitant to tell me. After some coaxing, she tells me that she saw a huge shadow figure cross the hallway, right at the top of the basement stairs. So that is three distinct manifestations, all in the same spot with two different witnesses. Since it scared my sister, I decided the next day to cleanse the area and also the space where my brother was staying. I cleansed the entire basement with sage smoke and blessed salt water. Never had anything happen again like that. He moved out shortly after, and I put together a few years later that it was a fractured part of himself. Like a PK manifestation. As far as I know, he's still walking around leaving pieces of himself wherever he goes. And for anybody listening, what is a PK manifestation? And excuse the bird. Can anyone tell me what me and my friends ran into in the woods? Me and my friends had a sleepover, and were really bored the next day, so we decided that we wanted to play manhunt in the woods near my house. We got to the woods and we played three or four rounds, and at that point it was really dark and we made a decision I regret, sort of, which we decided to continue playing even though it was practically pitch black. We thought that would make it much more funner. My friend, let's call her Ellen, was, she was the seeker, so me and my other friend, Leroy, went to hide in the woods. I was hiding in a bush area, and if you were walking on the main path, you looked out towards me and you shouldn't be able to see me, so I thought I had the best place ever. Then I heard shuffling, like somebody dragging something behind them. I looked around and I couldn't see anything until I looked at the path directly in front of me. I saw a man walking up. He looked like he was struggling to walk. But not just because he couldn't. It looked like he had just learned how to walk. That really freaked me out. But what scared me even more is when I moved forward to see him closer. I snap a twig. He looked directly at me. Well, I don't even know if I could say he looked directly at me because he had no face, no eyes, no nothing, just little dips where his eyes and nose and mouth should be. He didn't run towards me. He didn't do anything. He just looked at each other for a couple of seconds. That was before my adrenaline kicked in. I army crawled the hell out of there. I ran to Ellen, saw what, you know, and then we met up and she was just as frantic as I was. We both described the exact same man and we both knew at that moment that we both ran into whatever the hell that was. Freaked out and we ran to look for our other friend that we called him. We were screaming for him, but he wouldn't come out. Finally he picked up the phone and he told us that to come to, I guess, a certain tree. We went there and immediately he frantically told us about seeing the exact same man we don't know what this was. We're all absolutely terrified, so we decide that we're going to go back up into the woods and see if we can find it after looking for a couple of minutes. One of my friends, Ellen, who doesn't really know anything about paranormal stuff and all that, starts going on about how this could be an S-walker. She says multiple times, even saying the name, Wendigo, and we totally freak out and told her to stop saying the name, and then we hear a high-pitched blood-curdling scream come from the woods. We bolted out of there. Everything around us feels uncanny, and even to this day when I go back to those woods, I don't recognize the neighborhood I was running through when I was sprinting home, even though I've lived here my whole life. Everything felt so uncanny until I got back to my house, and even though it was months and months ago, I still frequently hear voices and see shadow figures when I'm around that area. 
I don't know what that was, but whatever it is, I feel that it's not leaving me or my friends. My friends have also had the same encounters with the voices and the figures. Can anyone else tell me what we could have seen that day in the woods and how to protect myself against that? It's never ever come closer enough to do anything, but I hate that I can see it when I'm outside. It's never inside my home, and it's always outside. And the dark figures, they look like shadows moving around, and I can hear voices, and it seems like something is walking behind me and my friends, even though there's nothing there. This all started after we saw the man with no face in the woods. So, can anyone tell me, what was that? Stories my mom told me from when she used to live in a haunted house. So my mom used to be a professional ice skater. She traveled the world for a few years when she was 18 to 19, and that would have been in the mid-70s. She quit ice skating and moved back in with her parents. They lived in an apartment about a shop in a small seaside town called Cleveleys. I said that wrong, I'm sure but it's about a 10 minute drive away from Blackpool. When she moved in, she said right away something felt off about the place. She never said she felt scared, but just different. She said the first time anything strange happened was a few days after she moved in. She was fast asleep in bed and her dad came in to bring her a cup of tea. He said something along the lines of, did you fall back asleep? She asked what he meant. He said that he had heard her get up and heard the bathroom door open and close and footsteps. A few days later, she walked back into the room and it was like a thick pipe of smoke. Now, this was really odd as none of them smoked a pipe. And she said, from this time, the smell of pipe smoke and unexplained appearance of pipe smoke was a regular thing. She also said that things would regularly move around the house. So if you put your keys down on the table when you went back to pick them up, sometime later they would be missing. The weirdest thing she said happened was occasionally they would hear what sounded like a party going on next door in the middle of the night. Loud music, people singing and laughing, and then all of a sudden it would just stop. The only issue with this is that the only building connected to theirs was a bank which would be closed at night. She said that when the landlord came to get the rent, she mentioned the strange things going on around him, and he said that it's strange that my mom mentioned the pipe smoke and the back room because the landlord's father used to smoke a pipe and passed away in the back bedroom. To me, this sounded really scary and unsettling, but she said she never felt scared or upset. There's one more thing that I'm not sure about mentioning, as it's really to do with ghosts and making my mom sound a bit crazy, but she also said that at the time she lived in the flat, she could tell who was going to call before the phone rang, or who'd be at the door before the bell went. I know what I saw, and it haunts me to this day. I was 17 years old. The cool thing to do at the time was to go to the Embreville Asylum in Chester County to explore. For backstory, the asylum was abandoned since the 1980s. At one point, it was a mental institution. It was an elementary school, and then it was a hospital, then a home for the mentally unwell. The asylum consists of 10 to 12 buildings each the size of an elementary school, of all of them dilapidated. There's an unmarked cemetery across the street with numbers for all the graves, but no names. I went with a group of about eight people at about 10 p.m. We went into several of the closer buildings, and they were creepy, but nothing out of the ordinary. We proceeded to what we referred to as the main asylum building. It was the biggest in the original building, this one gave me the creeps. There were gurneys in the hallways, things that were scattered everywhere, and it just had a kind of a cold vibe to it. We started moving through the building and found our way to a stairwell. 
I took the lead position and got walking. My buddy and I made our way to the fourth floor and realized the others weren't behind us. We went on ahead anyway. We approached a hallway intersection where to the left and right of us were large day room type rooms that had hallways that lead to open rooms that were widening as sort of as you entered them. Before I turned the corner, my buddy asked me if I had said something to which I responded no. He told me he swore he heard something. At this point, I turned the corner and pointed my flashlight toward the day room. In clear view, I saw something cross left to right inside the threshold of the door. It had the figure of a person, but with a light directly on it. it had no pigment. It was like the absence of color or light, blacker than the night outside. It had dimensions to it, no legs, human-shaped. I turned tail and ran, never again went back at night. I left feeling cold and terrified. It stuck with me since that day, and I think about it a lot. A spirit that presents as a female keeps showing itself to me. I have been experiencing paranormal activity for seven years now, and have believed it for about six. I started seeing this female spirit one year after moving into my new house in 2019. I had just gotten done being outside all day long during the summer and hanging out with my family, so I decided to take a shower. During my shower, I kept getting this feeling of being watched. Then I heard knocking on the bathroom door followed by my dad's voice saying my name. So I opened the front door figuring that he needed something from the bathroom. But when I opened it, no one was there. So I closed the door and figured I was just hearing things. And then I heard the knocking in my dad's voice a second time. So I figured he must have been messing with me to scare me. But again, when I opened the door, no one was there. I finished my shower and shrugged it off. Then I was looking at myself in the mirror and sort of popping pimples when I caught a glimpse of something in the mirror. So I looked up again and was frozen in fear. There was a lady with dark brown hair, makeup running down her face and a white dress on. Her skin looked pale. Then I turned around and she was still standing and staring at me. It sounded like she was mumbling or whispering something. I couldn't make it out. After standing there again frozen in fear, I ran out of the bathroom and screamed. After that experience, not only has this female spirit been presenting itself, but so have other spirits, but not exactly like this one. Not as clear and in human form. Most just as shadows. Step into the unknown with Paranormal M, your guide to the mysteries of the supernatural. Don't forget to subscribe, and if you think of it, drop a comment, and turn on notifications to stay updated with our latest discoveries. We invite you to join us on a journey beyond the limits of ordinary understanding. I've been having strange things happening in my apartment, and I'm desperately looking for logic. So I've been living in a casita apartment for about six months. Nothing has really happened besides the feeling of being watched and the casita creaks. But I dismiss that pretty quickly since I'm a 27-year-old female living alone with a 10-pound dog. And the casita is located in a rural-ish neighborhood. Anyways, the past two weeks, I noticed that there's some unexplainable occurrences, usually happening at exactly 3 a.m., and it's scaring the shit out of me. The first thing that happened was that at 3 a.m. I woke up. My dog was still sleeping next to me, so I just tried to get back to sleep. Suddenly, I heard a huge crash. My dog woke up, and I started to freak. I got up and got a broom handle in case somebody broke in, which is my worst nightmare. I go in, and I see that my hand drum that I put my sweet grass braid in fell so weird because the nail I hung it up on was still there and the drum was across the room. Usually every night I hear the casita creak, 
and I swear I hear footsteps. I usually just ignore it and go back to sleep convincing myself it's just my apartment creaking. Last night, though, was the worst. My casita had been getting freezing cold lately, even when I try to crank up the heat, so it was hard to sleep. After piling blankets and setting up a small space heater, my dog and I were able to settle down. At 3 a.m. I woke up because it was still freezing. I checked my thermostat and it was set to 35 degrees even though I set it to 70. Maybe the heater was broken. I checked the weather on my phone and it's 45 degrees outside. There was no wind or snow. I go back to my bed and the window starts to rattle violently. I'm terrified and I get up to see if there was any wind. The trees outside were completely still. And when I directly looked at the window, it stopped. The rest of the night was miserable. I kept hearing footsteps and a low murmuring, like somebody was talking in my kitchen. Thought it was all in my head, but my little dog went from barking her little head off to cuddling with me under the covers and shaking like a leaf, which is really unlike her. My mom's going to help me smudge. I'm native. And she has some more medicines than I do, but I can't get this out of my head. My dog's been on edge lately, and I'm trying to convince myself that this isn't paranormal. But I can't think of a logical explanation. How about you? The morning my grandma passed, 6 a.m., my grandmother is my best friend. She moved in with my parents when I was born to help take care of me. But the tea is, as my parents were on the verge of splitting at the time. But that's a different story. My grandma raised me. I was her baby. And would tell me that all the time. And that she also would never leave until I could fend for myself and I was an adult. We had a bond that I didn't fully understand until later on in life. With that being said, I hit my late teenage years and she got sick. I didn't know how bad it was. Mostly because my dad, and his mother, my grandma, he hid it from me. One day I get a call from my dad saying, Hey, your grandma's in the hospital and she's not going to make it. You need to come up here. So, I do, and I drive up there confused. I walk into her ICU unit. No one told me that. I bawled and grabbed her hand, told her not to leave me because I needed her, and she shook her head and squished my hand. The doctor told me before I walked into her room that she was sedated on what they called Michael Jackson drug. I'm not making that up, that's what they said. And mostly to be prepared for her not to be coherent or open her eyes. Well, when she did, as soon as I grabbed her hand, she was waiting for me. I leave the hospital, go home, go to sleep. I have this dream of my phone going off, and I remember everything is black and I can't see. But I hear my phone go off with a voicemail. So I check it, and it's my grandma's voice leaving me a voice message how, well, she always has, Hey, this is your grandma. I just wanted you to know that I love you. And I'm proud of you. And I'll see you soon. Call me back when you can. Bye. I wake up out of my dream to my dad calling me at 6 a.m. on the dot, telling me that she has just took her last breath. Second Sister So I want to start this by saying my family has had strange things happening to us for years, but this one really stuck with me. This happened when I was about 13 and my sister was 15. We lived in a two-story house with my mother and her boyfriend. They had a room downstairs and me and my sister lived upstairs. I need to explain the layout for this story to make sense. When you enter the house, through the big front door, you can see the living room and the stairs. Above the door is a huge semicircle window. 
which you can see into the living room with if you're upstairs. Upstairs, where me and my sister stayed, had four rooms and two bathrooms, two bedrooms and a bath on each side of the house with an open area in between. My sister's room was on the opposite side as her bathroom and the same for me. So one night we were home alone around ten at night. My sister was in her room on the phone with her friend. I was in my room watching TV. My sister is older and usually asks me to do things for her. And as a younger sibling, I kind of have to. Sibling rules, you know. So when I heard her call for me, I got up, went to her room, and asked what she wanted. She asked me to shut her bedroom door, so I did. About ten minutes later, I had to use the bathroom and made the journey to my bathroom. That's right by her room, by the way. On this trip, I looked at the window and I saw my sister in the living room looking at her phone. I thought it was weird because I didn't hear or see her leave her room as my door was still open. But after I got back to my room for a good 20 minutes later, I heard her call for me again. So, I leaned over the railing and I said, what do you want? But she didn't answer. She didn't even move. Then I heard, hold on, my sister's doing something, coming from her room. I opened the door and asked if she called for me and she responds, no, why are you yelling downstairs? I didn't answer. Quickly went back to the railing where I still saw my sister sitting downstairs. Same hair, outfit, posture, everything. I just looked at it. Went back to my sister's room, told her about it, and she told me I was crazy. Went back to her phone call. I shut her door, went to the railing, and looked at it again. This whole time it had its head down looking at what I assumed was a phone. Then as I stood there looking at it, it looked up at the window like it could see me. It smiled. Its face didn't look like my sister. Well, it did, but definitely off. Can't describe it. Went to my room, locked my door, and didn't go to my sister if she called for me. About three years later we moved out of that house. I've never seen it again. I never told my sister or her mother about what I saw, really, since it was just that once. But it stayed with me. The Apparition and the Power Outage The house I grew up in, the same one that my parents and one of my brothers live in to this day, are very active with benevolent spirits. I feel like sharing experiences with non-threatening entities is just as important as all the tales of demons and poltergeist and scary tall figures standing in doorways and negative experiences in a home. Now let's dive into some encounters and experiences. For some quick context, I grew up sharing a house with two female spirits. I felt their energy, had encounters, and still noticed them lingering around when I got to visit my parents to this day. One of the most intense encounters happened back in 2007. I was 13, my brother was 12, and the twins were 7. It was a humid day with thunderstorm warnings and dark skies. I remember it being late summer. The whole week prior was thunderstorming after thunderstorm. Or, rather, thunderstorm after thunderstorm. The storms knocked the power out, leaving the house dimly lit by candles and flashlights. My parents were in the garage, trying to get her generator to start, so my mom could at least have a cup of tea by boiling water in the kettle. Us kids, of course, wanted to be able to charge our Nintendo DSs, since that was our obsession like many kids growing up in the mid-2000s. I was sitting in the basement with my brothers, we were all sitting on the sectional, waiting for the power to come back on. Our DSs were all drained of power, and we were unsure of what to do. My brother Chad mentioned to me that he wanted to grab something from up in the bedroom that we shared, but didn't really want to go up alone. I knew he was afraid of the dark, so I didn't really bother to question him anymore. So we climbed up the stairs from the basement, walked through the tiled hallway that connects to the kitchen, and then turned left to face the stairs going up to the second floor. It was only ten or so steps, not a very steep or strenuous climb to make. 
There was just pitch black in front of us. A deep foreboding feeling was running through me. I always felt in tune with my intuitions and tried my best to listen to them. But things suddenly happened before I could do anything else. With our flashlight still pointing up the stairs, lightning flashed and illuminated the hallway. If you're standing where my brother and I were, you would see a hallway at the top of the stairs, which only went about 12 feet or so forward until you would run into the door to a linen closet. Standing in front of that linen closet at the end of the hallway was a woman. The brightness of the lighting almost hurt, yet I could still make out this woman standing upstairs. She was wearing a long skirt and a button-up shirt. Couldn't place an exact time period to the clothes, and still can't to this day. I just know it was from years, even decades prior to 2007. This figure was not facing us. She was staring off to the left of the hall toward my other brother's room. I can remember this intense feeling of fear. Now I think that was because we had no idea and a well, an apparition of a woman would appear before us, but not because the spirit was quote-unquote evil. After what felt like a minute, Chad and I bolted toward the living room, hopping onto the couch. We sat there, wide-eyed and probably staring into nothing, trying to piece together what we just saw. Luckily, nothing paranormal or strange happened the rest of the evening. We went back downstairs and played our Nintendo Wii, hoping to forget, you know, what we just saw. But I remember wondering who that apparition was. It could be Tara. She was much younger, and from then on I realized it wasn't just Tara in our home. This woman would make more appearances in the future. Luckily, she would be friendly in those situations. I've been encountering spirits in my childhood home, even to this day. I've been wanting to share some experiences myself and my family have had, dating all the way back to the mid-1990s. For quick context, I'm the oldest of four sons and we all grew up in this house. It's a small three-bedroom home in a quiet subdivision surrounded by wilderness. My parents bought it back in 1982 and still live there today. I come from a superstitious and some would call sensitive family. Most of them seem to be in tune with our extrasensory perception. In no ways do I consider myself to be a psychic or someone with an extremely good precognition and clairvoyance, but I do feel like I have, yeah, you know, I've been aware of unexplainable presences or feelings. Now let's get into the story. My mother explained to me that before she became pregnant with me, she never really noticed any strange or paranormal occurrences at home. When my mom got pregnant, she said things changed. At this point, she started feeling a presence while at home. My father's work at the time had, had him, I guess, just gone for weeks at a time. My mom found herself feeling lonely and overthinking. At night, while trying to sleep, she felt like someone was in the room with her. She said it wasn't an ominous or negative energy, but the opposite. As her pregnancy continued, small objects started vanishing and showing back up. She bought wind-up toys and toys that were activated by buttons. She placed them up on a shelf in a closet. They ended up on a closet floor, activated and playing. She says she saw a female figure move from one room to another in the upstairs halls. At that point, she wanted to understand why the house had all these paranormal energies. But the house was newly built, not even 20 years old at the time. The previous owner was a single parent, but she never knew the age or gender or the children. My mom started having complications with the pregnancy, and I was born nine weeks premature spent the first six months of my life in the hospital dealing with issue after issue. But I managed to pull through. I know this isn't related to the paranormal, but it's important context to later events and theories. 
There was a time when I was a few months old when a pair of hats my mother and great-grandmother wore to a wedding somehow got moved from the attic storage into my mom's closet. Spooked my mom momentarily, but by then she had come to terms that she was sharing space with some sort of friendly spirit ghost or presence. These things didn't bother her too much, but besides that, not much else happened. One of the strangest but powerful things that happened in my childhood home took place when I was still very young. You see, even though I was eight months old, I could still roll myself over very well, or even sit up. Embarrassing? Sure, but what can I do? I was just a baby. But anyways, my mom was home alone again with me. She put me down for a nap and went to lay down in her bedroom across the hall. She was quite tired, so sleep took over quite quickly. She says that she had vivid dreams. She was in some sort of a white room. It was bright. She was sort of standing in place, and she felt someone enter the space with her. It was a welcoming presence. One she felt before, but a more ominous feeling showed up like impending doom. Or that feeling when you just know something isn't right. Then she heard the voice of a girl. I told her, The baby, it's the baby. The voice repeated itself as she jolted awake. She sensed something was wrong. She rushed across the hall, which luckily was only a mere seven feet or so into my bedroom. I somehow had myself face down in the crib's mattress. I must have decided it was time to move myself around, but I was clearly unable to push my face out of the mattress. Ask my mom this story now, and she'll tell you with great detail how the real dream felt and how scary it all was. So as I got older, I was told around three or four, I started chatting to an imaginary friend. I would spend a lot of time sitting up in my room stationed on my floor with all sorts of toys. I would be having full-on conversations, apparently with no one. When my parents asked me who I was talking to, I told them her name was Tara. I told them she was a little girl a bit older than me. I said she was nice. I didn't let this up for years, I've been told. I can remember understanding at a young age, eight or nine, that our house had spirits in it. But I was raised and told that they were harmless, that they were just here with us, and I felt it too. I didn't mind it, honestly. It didn't scare me. What scared me instead was sudden loud noises and movies about vampires. Fast forward to my teenage years now. I was sleeping on a Friday night. Across from my bed was a large dresser, and pushed beside was a longer but shorter dresser. It was tall and sturdy enough that a young person could hop up on it and sit. I remember coming out of a strange dream. I started to wake up. I opened my eyes, and they were met with someone else's gaze. It was a young girl, dark hair, clothes that looked like they were from decades prior. She was sat up on my dresser looking at me. I jumped out of my skin because honestly, who expects that? Now, was she scary looking? No, I believe it was Tara. I've seen her a few other times, or possibly another female spirit come home to visit my parents, and at times I get the same intense feeling. It's very hard to explain. It's just like I know that one of these spirits are around and they're welcoming me back. I walk into the house, especially if I'm the first to arrive home, and the whole feel of my surroundings change. It's hard to explain. But I've come to learn it's the type of feeling I get when Tara must be around. When I'm spending time alone at the house, especially downstairs in the basement, I'll see a dark female figure move across the back of the room. The shape of the body reflects off the glass paneling of my parents' bar. It'll move into the laundry room and disappear. I've seen it in reflections of windows upstairs, standing in various spots around the home, as if they're just sharing space with me, as if they're just trying to say hi. I'm older now. I just turned 30. But in all the apartments I've lived in, I've had paranormal experiences. Nothing horrifying, thank goodness, but I always seem to have something happen. I'm okay with it. 
Maybe I'll share some of those moments another time. I would be lying to you if I tried to make my story sound like some horrid poltergeist haunting with objects throwing and evil lurking around. But I truly believe not all aspects of the paranormal are spooky and scary. Sometimes they're just strange at times, but they're wholesome. The experiences can be enlightening that maybe we do share our lives with others who have passed on who just want to make themselves known from time to time. Maybe to watch over us, who knows. It's all complex, but I do believe that I have had ghosts follow me around all my life. We have a banned word in our house due to many strong paranormal incidents. So we actually have a banned word in our household as it's caused a lot of strong activity in our house before and on multiple other occasions when the word has been said. The word is snake. And for some odd reason, it's the cause for many of the disturbing and honestly terrifying experiences me and my mother have been through. We live in a normal two-story house on an honestly pretty busy street. We've been living here ever since my birth, honestly. I'm 17, coming on 18 in a few months. Even from when I was little, I remember most of these experiences as they all dug a deep mental scar into my memories. But it's all honestly been rather calm now, as we've somehow figured out that the word snake somehow triggers it all. Sounds weird, I know. Take, for example, one time I had a friend around my house when I was about 13, maybe even 12. We were taking it in turns to play Metal Gear Solid 2 on the PS2. Every time we died, we'd mimic the voice shouting for Snake to get up as we thought it was funny, I guess. That's the main character's name. Well, come 30 minutes after getting off of the game, a foldable chair that was leaned against our wall was pushed down in front of our door, causing my friend to choke on a peanut that he has, well, he was in the process of eating, out of shock. He nearly passed out as the door became a problem to open up due to the heavy folding chair blocking the way. A more recent example is when I was playing Phasmophobia, and one of the ghost characters' last name was Snake. After all, in that game, you have to actually use your voice and talk to the ghost in-game to find all the clues to what type of ghost it is. Exactly a few minutes later, I heard somebody say my name towards the corner of my room behind me. I was alone that night. I shrugged it off as me potentially being paranoid due to playing a pretty scary game. I let it be for another 20 minutes when I actually felt something blow by my hair. I got up, walked straight out of my room, didn't even bother turning off the game, and slept downstairs that night. Honestly, I don't really know what to do. As I said, I think the word is the cause of most of these incidents. But I'm not too sure. Maybe it's just me overthinking it again. All I know is that whatever spirit is in this house with me, it's definitely not a nice one. The boy that was in my closet. I'm 17 now, but this happened from when I was 5 to 8, roughly. Because this happened so long ago, I'm sure there are a lot of things I've forgotten over time or unintentionally blocked out. Around the time I started kindergarten, we moved to a complex where I got a room of my own for the first time. I remember being scared to have a room all to myself, so I would always make sure my closet door was firmly closed because I was very scared of monsters in my closet. I think this might have stemmed from my mom watching a lot of horror content around me or maybe just a general childish fear. I remember it being shortly after we had moved in, I woke up when it was dark out. I could tell by my window that was right next to my bed. My closet door opened and this boy hovered, very low to the ground still, maybe an inch off, even he seemed about my height and size, but didn't make a sound as he walked. He hovered out of the closet, walked in a straight path from the closet to the window, but he stopped midway at the foot of my bed and just stared at me. His face was like melted glass. 
similar to the longer-faced ghost kid from Coraline. Sorry, this is the only example I can think of. He wore a sailor suit very similar to the results you'd get by searching 1950s boy's sailor suit. I remember wanting to scream, but I couldn't. I hid underneath my blankets for a long time, and I don't remember what happened after that, but I assume I eventually just fell asleep. It might have been a few days or even a week, but I saw him again shortly after. It was roughly the exact same encounter, so it doesn't stand out in my brain, but over the course of a few months, I had the courage to look back at him. I was very scared, but he would never do anything, and I think that I knew that. Never attempted to climb on my bed or get closer to me. He only ever stopped and stared at me, and that never changed. After I started looking at him, I learned that after he left the foot of my bed, he would go to the wall on the left and form a hole in my wall that he would go through. I remember there was a few times that I would get up in the morning and try to see the portal, but of course, it was never there. There was a long time of build-up, but eventually I just wasn't scared anymore, and I remember the feeling of not being afraid when I looked back at him. After I wasn't scared anymore, I was able to get out of my bed right after he'd leave and try to go through the portal, but it would close before I could get into that wall. I remember one specific night where he didn't show up. I got confused because by that time it'd become a routine to see him every night. I got up and looked out my window to see him. He was feeding on deer on the property. A deer, pretty common in the area. He didn't look up at me or anything, but I remember just staring at him. After we moved away from the complex, I experienced anything close to this or even had a dream or him appear in a dream. But here's some other small details I want to add. He only existed in the complex. He never appeared in my school or at daycare. My mom told me a few years ago that the neighbors in the complex would tell her that I would play games by myself, but seemingly pretend that I was playing with another person. But I myself have no memory of that, so I don't know how reliable that is. From what I remember, no other kid in the complex experienced anything similar to this, including my two sisters who shared a room across from mine. I would tell people about the boy that I would see, though. It's taken me a long time to come to the conclusion that this probably paranormal thing was happening, so I wanted to share it here. I want to know if anybody had any similar memories that they carry with them. I drew the layout of my room and a recollection of what the boy looked like. The drawing is not super detailed, and because it's drawn from memory, I'm sure my memory has changed a lot over time. The Time a Spider Spirit Stole My Weed Pen I used to work at a music and video studio. I was working on an editing project late at night. In the program I was using, you had to push the render button for the computer to compile your changes to the video. So every 20 minutes, the computer would have you think for 2-5 to five minutes and I'd step outside the door and hit my hash pen before continuing. I was having a great time and very happy with my work, and on one break, I saw a spider sitting on its web and I grinned and thought, I'm going to get this spider high as hell. Except I was surprised when there was an immediate voice in my head that didn't sound or feel like my internal dialogue that sternly said, It is unethical to alter a being's consciousness without his permission. Took me a bit back, took a big hit while contemplating this voice, but I was really feeling myself and a grin came across my face and I said, That spider ain't got nowhere to go, he'll be fine. Blew a huge cloud of hash vapor at this spider. Laughing to myself, I walked back to the desk, and looking intently at the computer monitor, I just set the hash pen on the desk to my right. I went back to work, did my thing, and when it was time for my next mini break, the pen was gone. Made no sense. The desk was clean, couldn't find it that night. Came in the next day, told my studio partners the story, asked them to grab it if they saw it. No one saw the pen for months. I started apologizing to every spider I came across went out of my way to not disturb any webs, 
It was basically as nice to spiders as possible, short of dropping insects in their webs. Finally, one day I was at the desk running the boards and recording some music. I needed a writing pen to make a note, and without looking I reached to my right for a pen on the desk, and suddenly I was holding my missing hash pen. Finding Small Teeth This is the weirdest thing to ever post about, and almost the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. We can share about the others later. I've always felt a connection to what some may call spirits or the other side, but nothing have ever really happened to verify this, and I've thought past things like, show me a sign, how can I know this is real, etc., Context, I work from home and have my youngest with me home all day, every day. I only leave for grocery pickups, and other times I leave, there's a trustworthy adult here with my kids. Randomly last summer, while cleaning my bedroom, I found a tooth. It looked like a child's first lost tooth, or one that was very small. I knew I didn't keep my kids, and... It was really freaking me out for a moment, but I chalked it up to, well, we're living in my husband's and my grandparents' house. He lived here as a child, and I've never had a sinking or doubtful feeling here that this tooth was on the side table where we changed our phones, and I would have seen it. Today, almost seven months later, the same thing happens. I find a small tooth in the same place in the same room as before. I seriously even check my son's mouth. Like, did you somehow lose a tooth while sleeping and place it on my bedside table? Was she trying to tell me something? Backstory This takes place back in 2019. I was going through some issues with my family and I was couch hopping, but basically living out of my car. I had a cousin that I hadn't spoken to in a while, and they messaged me one day, tell me that she had heard I was homeless, asked if I needed a place to stay. This cousin and I used to get along super well. So long story short, I moved into her house with her and her mom and shared a room with her. Her house was the leftmost in a fourplex. Does that make sense? So her bedroom windows look out to the neighbors, but the other wall of the house was shared with another person's house. It wasn't weird or run down, but the previous renter, for some reason, had sealed the front and both bedroom windows shut with nails then either painted or used some material that couldn't be removed and blocked the windows so you couldn't see out or into the house. Only the sun could come through. While there, I experienced a lot of weird things. But this one was the one that stuck out the most. A couple of weeks leading up to the event in question, I'd been having really weird nightmares that I could never remember, but always woke up out of breath and clutching my chest trying to slow down my heartbeat. My cousin was in her bathroom one day. The bathroom only has one door and it's connected to the room. It was also relatively small. And I noticed that there was something almost engraved into the wood of the door, like somebody's name. It had been painted over. So we're analyzing this carving and come to the conclusion that it's a girl's name. Can't remember the name for the life of me. Just assumed it was a kid or something who carved their name after this discovery. Things for me just progressively start to get worse. I start to feel extremely tired every time I'm home. I start waking up with an alarming amount of bruises and scratches that I can't explain. My best friend comes over one day. We're in the room, so I tell her about the name we found on the door. Just because her and I are into creepy things, and she practices Santeria, the Cuban version. So we always talk about things that relate to her religion and spiritual things in general. She starts kind of joking about it, but she's joking around and she uses the girl's name, but pronounces it incorrectly every time she repeats it. I can feel myself getting progressively angrier for whatever reason the more she's doing it to the point where I interrupt her. And I kind of wind up rudely correcting her. We both just looked up at each other and as the anger disappears with my words, I tell her I have no idea why I started feeling so upset about the girl's name being said incorrectly. 
We let it go, just assuming it was a random event. Some time passes. I'm still waking up with more and more bruises and scratches, and at this point, it very much looks like I'm being heavily abused. One night, my cousin and her mom go out and leave me at home alone. I was in her bedroom watching TV with the door open, and there's a clear view of the living room in the hallway from where I'm sitting. But all the lights are off, so it's just complete darkness except for the TV. I get a FaceTime call from another friend who's in her car with her sister. I'm just having a normal conversation when I get the urge to tell her about the name on the door. As soon as I'm done telling them about what was basically going on, I start to get extremely lightheaded like I was about to pass out. My vision blurs. And then I hear this extremely clear, almost church-sounding bell like it's right next to my head. Then, absolutely nothing like my ears had been stuffed with cotton. As I'm trying to clear my vision, I look up at the doorway and I see the figure of a girl, maybe five foot six or something, waist-length black hair, and that's all I can make out. I blink again, and she's gone. The blurred vision and the lightheadedness lasts for maybe another one to two minutes, and that's when I'm finally back to normal. Pick up my phone, my friend and her sister have broken out into a sob as they're asking me if I'm okay. I told them I was fine, I just got disoriented, and they tell me that after I dropped my phone, they could hear a woman screaming, bloody murder. They thought somebody had come into the house and was hurting me. I was clearly confused because I wasn't screaming, and I definitely didn't hear any screaming. I closed the bedroom door after we get off the phone, and after they're done making sure I'm okay, I just stay awake the rest of the night just waiting for my cousin to get home. After that night, new bruises stopped showing up, and shortly after, I moved out and stopped speaking with said cousin due to different issues. Till this day, I can remember the sound of that bell. It was so unsettling, I'll never forget that night. Generational Spirit I recently, being a month and a half ago, moved in with my fiance and her two-year-old daughter. Well, mine in every way, but blood. Not important, though. We got to talking about this subject, and my fiance disclosed her connection with an entity that has only form of a very tall, blacker-than-night human figure. His name is Grim. As far as she knows, he's been with her family since her dad was nine when his oldest brother started to abuse him. According to her, it was the kind of abuse that would get you killed if anybody found out. Anyways, he supposedly appeared and followed her father around until she was born and then started to watch over her. And then some life things happened with her mother and father and Grimm bounced between the three of them. Grimm isn't malevolent or evil per se. He's just there. Sometimes moves small things around. Think like stuffed animals or cups. But he does mess with people in and out of the way techniques that start to abuse my fiance or her mother. And then my fiance had her daughter and Grimm began watching over her since her bio dad is a complete waste of air. He did some bad things to my fiance many times. Anyways, she's been saying that she's been seeing him in her new apartment outside her daughter's room when she goes out to help her in the middle of the night just standing there watching, not touching or anything. We had the conversation come up, and I tossed some theories around, and we agreed. Grim is a protective spirit. Then my fiancé said he placed his hand on her shoulders reassuringly. They did to me, but I'm not kidding. 100% felt something there. Skinwalker Encounter Last summer, my National Guard unit was activated for a force protection mission for about a month and a half. We were conducting roving patrols in our Humvees, and my platoon was put on night shift 5P-FA. We were given a map of checkpoints that were to hit each shift. At about 2A, me and my partner were making our turnaround on our checkpoints and hitting the furthest one out of the TOC. This checkpoint was out in the middle of nowhere and had trees surrounding the whole area. It was an artillery range, by the way. 
When we got there, we got out and started roaming on foot, but stayed close to the vehicle to look for suspicious activity. There was nothing to report or activity because it was so barren, just like every night. We sat on the hood of the truck for a while before leaving and my partner played this weird skinwalker call audio he found on Spotify. It was weird, and he was just messing around. But, not even a minute later, all of a sudden everything went really calm and the same sound from the audio came from the darkness in the thick of the woods. We both looked at each other, kind of spooked. Then something from the woods started running towards us and we instantly jumped in the vehicle and took off without looking back. Neither of us believe in skinwalkers, so we thought it might have been an animal and that our minds were simply playing tricks on us because of the long shift in the late night. But nevertheless, it was a pretty scary experience. Everything from the eerie calmness to the terrifying shriek coming from the complete darkness of the woods. All of that was enough to keep me up the rest of that night. Ask Reddit One was an old man who died in my house about 40 years earlier. Me and my grandma would hear him walking around sometimes in steel-toed boots. And one time he actually started playing country music from the 50s on a laptop that was closed and powered off. He only ever showed himself a couple of times, but never around me or my grandma. Only to my aunt, who had been staying in the basement. She one day asked if we had ever seen anything in the house. Then told us that she had seen an old man peek out at her from the laundry room. Apparently he didn't look like he was evil, just kind of looking around to see who was there. There was a spirit that never really showed itself or said anything, but it would move things to weird places, throw things across the room, lock doors, and would also slam doors. One day my dog was outside, but I heard something downstairs. Completely forgetting my dog was outside, I called down the stairs as I was worried he was getting something as per usual, but as I called down the stairs into the pitch black basement... I heard a crystal clear low growl and kind of just ushered the dog to come upstairs by calling his name. He never came up. I was just going downstairs when I heard my dog howling in the front yard. No one was home. No TV was on. Nothing. Safe to say I waited outside with my dog for my grandma to get home from work that day. Another one was a little girl. No one could ever see her but me. She only ever showed herself a couple of times, though. Once, when I was really young, she appeared behind my door, which was wide open. She was kneeling down, crying really hard. Of course, I freaked out when my grandma came rushing in and she was no longer there. Another time, she showed herself when I was in sleep paralysis, but this time I could only slowly move my eyes, which led me seeing her kneeling down in the corner of my room, crying yet again. She once sent a picture from my phone to her. It was like a white forehead and black hair. At the time, I had blonde hair and had not sent any picture of my forehead and no one was home or had access to my social media. Sometimes me and my grandmother would hear her crying around the house or she would throw things sometimes, but I had a feeling she was traumatized, died at a young age due to the way that she had literally brought sadness into a room. I'm tearing up just thinking about it. I also endured my fair amount of trauma in the home, so sometimes I felt connected to her, but almost too connected for my personal comfort. I began feeling the sadness that she brought with her. I think I may have gotten an attachment from it. I am of Aboriginal descent, and one day my grandmother decided she wanted to smudge my room because activity had gotten super bad in there, and it was always at least seven degrees colder than the rest of the home. She immediately felt a coldness in the corner, asked if that's where the little girl had been crying. She was right. As she was smudging, I started to cry very abruptly and hard, and I was nearly sobbing. My grandma had to stop smudging and then told me that the girl most likely had an attachment to me. And I shouldn't have had cried because, in our culture and beliefs, that means you are inviting them to stay with you. My grandma died a couple of years later, and I moved out of the home but I still sometimes feel like she's with me. Ask 
read it. So me and my friend were in scouts camping, around 16 years old at the time. The site we went to had the old army style tent that you see. It looks like a mini lodge with a short pole on each side and two long ones in the center to give it kind of a house look. We had a tent to ourselves after putting it up. We chose a platform away from most of the group as we were older by a couple of years. It was on a hill and you could stand under the far edge of the quote-unquote foundation. It was a steep hill that you would have to climb up, kind of come from one side of it. But going to sleep, one night me and him just shooting the shit, sitting on our cots. Someone kicks the far end of my cot. I was looking at it the whole time and I knew I didn't see the canvas touch the cot, so wouldn't have been somebody kicking the side of the tent into my cot. Weird. Happens again a few minutes later, thinking it's strange, and we both go to bed. I wake up soaked. It had been raining that night, my feet are dirty, and I'm tired as fuck. My buddy starts telling me a dream that he had. I woke up, ran out of the tent, down the hill to Sam's tent, asked him, Where's Darman at? He pointed toward our tent, but I ran toward the bathroom. Not a minute later, Sam comes to our tent and hands me a hat and says, he left us at my tent last night. I didn't go to his tent. He retells the whole dream my buddy had, but says that it was me that did it apparently, not my buddy. Even saying that I, Darman, asked, where's Darman? Mind you, my buddy and I looked nothing alike. He easily had a hundred pounds on me. I was blonde and he had brown hair. We believe he had some weird body swap thing. Ask Reddit. As a high school slash university student, I worked in a restaurant which was an old Iron Master's mansion in the UK. The building itself was around 350 years old, and before it was a restaurant. It was a retirement home complex with like a morgue and an always pitch black attic. I worked there for about four years part time, but full time in the summer breaks. There would always be the feeling of never quite being alone, even if it was just in the restaurant, and a lone manager in the office. I would often hear floorboards creaking above, sounding like people walking over them, to the point I would go upstairs and investigate. In my peripheral vision, I often would catch the motion of someone turning the corner out of my sight, as if someone was walking away from me. Again, this was to the point where I would walk around the corner and ensure no customers or any other staff members were there. The running joke between the staff was that the ghost was called Mary. And anyone reported anything strange, it was just brushed off as old Mary again. One night, one of the managers organized a psychic evening. The night went as planned, and at the ending of the psychic, she had like a little Q&A. The organizing manager asked the psychic, Do you get any vibes from this place? The psychic replied that there was an elderly lady rolling around, and her name was not Mary but Elizabeth. I was working on the bar that night with one of my friends. The manager hurried over to us in an excited manner and said, The psychic said the ghost's name is not Mary, but Elizabeth. When he said the name Elizabeth, all the power went out in the building. The only light was the emergency lighting for the fire exits and the one Red Bull fridges, which was on a different circuit for some reason. We all stood there for about ten seconds, silently frozen. Then the power came back on. We awkwardly laughed and then carried on. After that, I always ensured I corrected people when they blamed anything strange on Mary to Elizabeth. Ask Reddit. I have a couple. One time I had my golden earring. They're 50 years old and they're precious to me. They were forgotten on the table in a hotel. Usually I wear them on, but that day I didn't, and I remembered it too late. We were already away from another hotel. It was a summer trip. I felt sad, but at some point I suddenly had a strong assurance that they'll be there in another hotel in another city. When we came in, they were lying on the floor in the room that I was staying. I didn't unpack my bags in the room yet, didn't tell anybody how I found them, it was so weird, as if it was so sad that they teleported or something. At one point I had a dream where I was told that in two months from the day I'm dreaming, 
a rock star will be dead. Didn't say which one, but as I woke up, I immediately put a date on my calendar out of curiosity for some reason. In two months, the 21st of July, at the day after the date that I was told Chester Bennington had died, I didn't listen to Linkin Park, only maybe to one song or two, but was sad and shocked. As if it was something I saw coming. It was so weird. I do have my calendar as the proof still. I had a similar experience years later, and I dreamed that there were riots in the streets. And there were some black folks fighting against racism, and the next week BLM movement happened. I don't think I had a prophetic dream since then, but it was a bit freaky for me when all of it happened. Funny that those prophecies didn't have anything to do with me or my personal life or interests. Ask Reddit. This had been bothering me for a long time. When I was in fourth or fifth grade, I went to a sleepover. We were in the basement. Parents were asleep on the second floor. We were also supposed to be asleep, so we took turns being stationed at the top of the basement stairs in the kitchen, listening, just in case we woke our parents up. On my turn, I heard a noise. I crept down the hallway toward the black staircase to listen. There was a bathroom door there, like a half bath just off the kitchen. The door was cracked and the light was on. When I looked through the crack, I saw a woman. She was young, twenties or younger. I was young at the time too, so I may have misjudged. Normal clothes, no weird visual effects. Didn't seem like a ghost, but like a real person. Very curly blonde hair, almost wet-looking 80s ringlets. She was looking down at something, but looked up at me through the door and looked concerned and scared. I immediately felt like I had caught her, like I wasn't supposed to see her there. Since I thought she was a real person, I ran back down the basement steps, told the other girls to hide. We did for a few minutes, but after nothing happened and they started to question me. I'd sort of assumed that somebody else was in the house. Maybe my friend had an older sister I'd caught sneaking back in. It wasn't anyone but us and the parents. And after a little while, they assumed I'd made the whole thing up as a prank. Never had an explanation for it. I don't think she was a ghost. The house wasn't that old. If I was hallucinating or sleepwalking then, 30 years since, it's never happened again. Ask Reddit. When I was 16, I had a best friend who lived maybe a two-minute walk from my house. I used to hang out at her place more often than we did mine. Anyways, her parents always told me that they thought they had a ghost. It was kind of a joke around the house since the house was really old. Oh, we're out of salt? The ghost took it. Something falls, ghost knocked it over. You get it. The house was old enough that random things in the house just didn't work. For example, the upstairs bathroom light switch just didn't work, so the light was basically always on. I was there often enough that I felt that if there was actually a ghost or something, I would have experienced something, but nada. One night, my best friend and I had just come back from watching Paranormal Activity 2. I know, one of the creepiest ones. I'd gone back to bed maybe an hour or two after we got back, which, if I remember right, was about 11 p.m. We'd gotten up in the middle of the night, maybe 3 or 4 a.m., and we had gotten to the washroom. Now, because the light in the bathroom was always on, the rule was to always keep the door closed. Anyways, I do my thing, I go to leave. I open the door and walk out slowly, trying not to make noise. I'm turning the doorknob in a kind of quiet manner to shut the door so you don't hear the click of the latch. I pulled the door closed, turned the knob back to the latch door, heard the door click closed, and right as I let go of the handle, the door just ripped open, like I just shut it in someone's face but didn't swing open. It just ripped open and stopped dead. I remember just turning around and bolting into my friend's room. It's the weirdest thing I've ever experienced in that house. After just watching Paranormal Activity then having that happen on the same night, yeah. 
Spooked feels like the right word. Ask Reddit. I had an older brother who would steal anything that wasn't glued down. So one time when I was like nine or ten, I thought he'd been coming into my room at night. I had gotten this spy kit as a gift, and one of the things that was in it was an intruder detector, which had a simple clock attached to a trip wire. I had the idea of one night proving that he was coming in my room to sort of pilfer whatever was being set up. The tripwire at my door to have proof that he was coming into my room at night. I awoke several hours later when the tripwire tripped, and it was loud because it was pulled with a lot of force. I still remember 30 years later that snapping sound. I sat up startled thinking I caught my brother sneaking in, but no one was there. A second later, my door slammed shut hard. Now, at that point, I thought it was the wind or something, but saw the tripwire was pulled into the room, like something had caught it entering the room. I sat up straight as an arrow, very freaked out. A few minutes later, I opened the door to see if anybody else was up, but the whole house was asleep, and it was clear that they had been all night. I left the light on, stayed up for the rest of the night, and nothing else weird ever happened, though. And I lived there until I was about 21. Albeit on and off from 18 to 21. I should note that I don't believe in supernatural anything. But this is the one thing I have no explanation for. Two sleep paralysis demons of the same species. So for context, I had a period of time during my senior year and a portion of my mission when I would get sleep paralysis. It usually isn't like these experiences, it only happened two times. The first time was during my senior year. It started off as it usually does. I woke up and my body would move. I tried to turn on my lamp. I think I moved my arm toward it and then blinked and it was back to where it was. This is the usual thing that happens to me, but this time I thought it would be scary if there was a person in the room. Then all of a sudden there was a mangled girl on top of me. I could still breathe, so it wasn't the same experience as when people usually say things happen to them. But it was on top of me. And now what it looked like was a pale white and had streaks of black that looked like the black paint that Arnold had and Predator just all over her body. I usually don't scream when weird things happen to me. I was very scared, but I was able to stay semi-calm. I kept telling myself I'm still semi-dreaming, and I was able to wake myself up by breathing hard. As soon as I turned on my lamp, she was gone. That was also the last time I had sleep paralysis until I kind of started my mission. There is a difference between my mission sleep paralysis and my senior year paralysis. During this sleep paralysis wave, I would say it was more like an out-of-body experience. I would be awake, like sit up, turn, look at the wall or around the room. I'd be able to see the room just the same as I could when I was awake, which I thought was weird because when I did wake up, I would wake up laying down with my eyes closed, not sitting up or in the position I was in when I was having the sleep paralysis. Now, the second demon that I saw was also pale white with black strips all over his body. And when this one happened, I woke up to see the door opening and a person crawling in. I could see the room very well because of the street lights outside. He came to the foot of my bed and had the biggest grin. Then he looked at my mission companion. Now, during this one, the weird thing I remember is I felt no fear. When he looked at my comp... I actually got super pissed off at the demon, so I lunged at him, but he held up one of his hands and the left hand of my body was cramped really bad. I was almost frozen in place, but this pissed me off more. I started to push through and I was able to slowly get closer to him, and when I did this, he stopped smiling and got an almost annoyed look on his face. He crawled out of the room. When I couldn't see anymore, 
I had a falling sensation like I usually do in these sleep paralysis episodes, and I wake up back and half my body cramping. And when I say half, I mean half my face was cramping to the point my lips and only half of my body were cramping. I was like showing that half of my teeth. Now, I don't think it was a seizure because I don't have a history of seizures and haven't had anything like that since. I still had motor functions in my arm and leg the same amount you have during cramps. This was the weirdest sleep paralysis episode I had. And I say that they're the same species because they have the same skin and look to them. What do you guys think? I need some advice to identify what I've seen. I'm 16 years old and from the Netherlands. When I was around 7 to 8, can't remember the exact age. It was like 2014, 2015. It was a warm summer day in the mid-2010s. The best part of my life so far. I was alone out in the garden playing in the pool. I loved playing outside in that garden till daytime. I was just swimming and playing with toy soldiers for like an hour. Then I stood out of the pool and looked up straight, and on top of my shed I seen a very tall figure crouching down. I could tell it was tall because it had his knees just above its head while crouching. Its right arm was gripping the gutter drain on the side of the shed and the other one was holding itself up on the roof. It had jet black skin and a dirty grin on its face. The smile was all the way up to its ears and it had bright white eyes and as soon as I noticed it, I saw its pupils went pinpoint, but its smile stayed the same. And after about ten seconds that felt like hours, it jumped into the bush beside the shed and to be honest, I did piss myself. Genuine piss running down my leg, mind you. Then I stared at the bush for like two minutes frozen in shock before running inside and telling my parents. She didn't believe me until years later when I brought the story up again. She said that she knew I saw something. I had many different drawings on the thing and written many stories in school about the thing I'd seen. I didn't go near that bush for years. Sometimes I'm out and about and I feel like that feeling of being watched. Not an ordinary feeling of that. I mean the feeling of that watching me. From the start of last year, I've become an Orthodox Christian and that feeling has stopped. And I know many people will think I'm lying about this story, but I'm serious. That day traumatized me, and I remember almost every detail. Shadow Man Hey everyone, I thought I'd come on here for some advice because I'm absolutely terrified, but over the past few days, I've seen a shadow figure either stood at the end of my bed or walking past the end of it. And it's scaring me so much, I think this might be just a man from his features. But it's scaring the hell out of me, and I haven't been able to sleep in days. I can only sleep during the day when someone in the house is awake. I've tried sleeping with lights on, my TV, and other things, but I just can't sleep. It's gotten to the point where I'm being just bringing all my food upstairs because I know I won't sleep and I'm too scared to go downstairs. The other day I actually broke down in tears to my mom because this is how scared I am. I can't stage my room or anything involving smoke because I have chinchillas in my room. But this shadow figure is about 6 foot 2 and I'm a very short 15 year old girl. I'm so scared if anybody's able to help it'll be greatly appreciated. Edit. I'd also like to say the shadow figure has also touched my face, and I felt it, but it's never hurt me, but I am still very scared. I've also posted this on another subreddit, and people just keep saying it's sleep paralysis or something else, but I know it's not sleep paralysis because I do have sleep paralysis, and this isn't that. And, if you have chinchillas, assuming that they're in a cage, I would consider that a mobile home. Move them outside a bit. Do your thing. Bring them back in later when the smell's a bit gone. You can do it. See ya. Welcome, fellow enthusiasts of the unexplained, to Paranormal M. 
Subscribe and turn on notifications to join us as we unravel the mysteries of the paranormal. We guarantee a thrilling adventure filled with twists and turns that'll leave you wanting more. And drop a comment if you can. Helps us with the algorithm. Let's get started. Can someone help me find out what this is? And how to do it? So basically my dad is 50. Lived in South Africa till he was 17, and when he was about 13 or 14, him and his friends would skip school. They'd stay at his house whenever my nan and granddad were at work. One of his friends told him about this ghost thing, which was a rumor in a school. He can't remember how it worked exactly, but it was something involving a book, a rubber band or elastic band, and a key, I think. All of his friends were in his room and the door was locked. They did the thing with the book and heard many, many loud bangings on the door. And after a while, they were obviously kind of shit scared and they went outside and there was a large scratch on the door that wasn't there before. Only noticeable if you were told it was there, but it was big. Does anybody know what the fuck this was? I've looked everywhere and I have no idea what this is or how it worked. I'm obviously not going to do it, but I want to know what it was and how it worked. My dad sounds genuine with this story. I want to know if anybody else has tried whatever this was and what happened to them. And what if the door wasn't unlocked? By the way, this is an edit because I changed my mind. It's probably for the best if you don't tell anybody how to do it. I'm assuming it was dangerous if it left a large scratch on the door and was banging on it. It was probably trying to get in. Scariest Night of My Life First, I want to introduce myself. I'm a 20-year-old male from Serbia. This story happened around 6 or 5 years ago. That would be making me 14 or 15 years old. I live in the rural part of Serbia, but not rural enough to say anything can happen. It's just we're around 25 kilometers away from the nearest town. In Serbia, we have villages, which I live in. They aren't really villages, as most of the people from there work in some industry, and almost all of them have small gardens that they do on the side. But in a sense of number of people, it's not that much. So in a sense, it's rural, if you can imagine. So around that time, my close friend and I would ride bikes all day long and all night long. We were at that point everywhere everybody could have been, and you know, a very large area. I'm just going to say we rode bikes for more than 50 kilometers every day for around a few years, except the winter, of course. So the story starts with us being bored on summer vacation. There's a tradition that almost all villages have football tournaments in summer, and it would take around 7 to 10 days to finish, depending on the number of teams that are submitted. So we already gone to number them, and nothing would be different than normal, because it was the road that we knew the people we knew it. It would just be normal stroll sort of a thing. So what we did is, is we would go around 6 p.m. It would take us around 40 minutes to get there. There were two options for how to get there. It's the main road that's a lot longer, around 30 minutes or more, because it was going around hills and forests. And at the second road, that was going through forest. We chose the one through the forest, not because we were fearless or anything like that, but it was for safety reasons. The main road had asphalt, but not lights. We didn't have lights on our bikes. We would always get lost since we rode bikes off-road. And a lot of heavy trucks used that road, and it would be easy for them to kill us. So we chose the second road, thinking that, because we don't have any dangerous wildlife we thought it would be safest. The story goes like this. We go a few times, and nothing weird happens. While nothing happened, I want to describe a road to you. From my house to my friend's house, it was a main road. We lived around five minutes from each other on bikes, of course. It's a small downhill from my house to his, and from his house you'd have to kind of go on another main road to another neighboring village, and that road is like a very big downhill, and that's close to his house. Then we pass a church. The church is on a bit of flat part of the hill, and then another downhill up the bridge on a small stream, and from there it's a big uphill to a neighboring village. 
From there, it was a flat ride until we would change road to a rural part. And this road was used by tractors. So it would look like this. I'll put the link somewhere. Sorry guys, we can't see it. Of course, this is not the location. It's just a picture that could resemble the one. Then we would go downhill past the little stream, go steep uphill, and from that part it would be flat for around three kilometers. There was no forest on that flat part. It was just fields of wheat and corn. But from the downhill was only very thick forest, which was like the link to the right of the forest and uphill. But left was a steep downhill to a stream, even more than the length of the downhill was very long, like seven kilometers. And then we would come across our first houses of our destination. During the day, not scary at all. Even I would say it's a beautiful road, which we used before our rise. And this road was very much known from us from a long time ago. A few details there is a lot of headstones on this road because a lot of people died there while falling down trees. And a few graveyards were on that road, but we were never scared of it. There were a few stories around the bridge between our village and the first neighboring village where we passed the church. Stories were usually a drunk man would disappear and they'd find him a few days later all bloody and scratched. He would say that some creature was on his shoulders and was choking him. But you can imagine how those stories from a drunk man may seem false. So that was all the description for situation and environment now what happened. When tournament started, the moon was full, and we could see everything without lights. And while going home, we would hear all their animals all around us. Some are howls, crickets, foxes, dogs in the village, and so on, even though we were going home every night around 1 to 2 a.m. But something changed when it started getting darker. First, we started hearing steps behind us, and around 10 meters away at first, and we're off the road, so we thought it was some animal. But we checked a few times, but there was nothing there except, I would say, a chasm. Because if you fell, it would be hard to come back up. I can even say that if you did fall, and didn't hit any tree while falling, you'd fall directly on rocks and probably die. So we came home, didn't think much of it. But then as there was less and less light, the steps became closer and closer skip a few nights because nothing happened as we were talking to try not to get scared. The last night was hell. Before we got out of the village, my friend stopped me and said this to me. Whatever you do, do not look behind us tonight. If you see something, do not pay any mind. Just go your way and if you feel scared, pray and everything will be all right. He at that time already read a Bible a few times and was a believer. I was a believer too, but I never really given it much thought. Like I believed because of tradition, so I said to him, everything will be fine either way, but I will, you know, do as you say. I believed in my friend because he never lied to me, even though we knew each other for around 10 years. We then started going uphill to get home, and this way it took us around an hour and 30 minutes to get back because now all downhill when we came was uphill. From the moment we stepped out of the light, it was behind up now, it was like a meter behind us. We could feel it. All we knew was that something big and heavy, and it sounded like it had hooves. The feeling was like that of a large cow being behind us, but it didn't have four legs. It had a weird rhythm like it was walking on two, but the ground was shaking with each step when I say shake. I mean it would feel like vibrations clearly. We were frozen solid even though it was 30 degrees Celsius outside and everything was quiet except the steps. There were no animals, no insects, no dogs, no nothing. That thing was following us around one hour non-stop. And that hour was like years. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't have looked back because I was so scared. All we did was walk in silence. We didn't let any sound, not even breathing. Being as quiet as a night when we finally got into the first village. We were white and cold to the touch. While everything else was warm... We then got to one public water faucet, washed our faces and hands because we wanted to get some of the heat on us. Then we sat under streetlight for around 20 minutes to get us normal again. We were so happy that we were the first of all alive that we just started going for one last part. That's that road where the bridge is up ahead of the church. Before we left the last streetlight, my friend told me, Listen, now is the hardest part. 
the bridge is turning point. If we see something or anything, this is the plan. We're going downhill and don't stop even if you can't pedal no more. Don't stop until you reach the church. If I'm not there, go to the church immediately. If you see something on the way down, don't pay any attention and just go your way. After that, when we, if God allows us, we will met before church. We'll go together if anything goes down. I just nodded and we get to where we're going side by side. Saw nothing. We crossed the bridge, stopped before the church because we couldn't have pedaled anymore. We looked at each other, started going ahead when we took a step to be before the church's gate. We heard a sound which I can't imitate or describe coming from the bridge. It was a sound that sounded like a hundred people screamed and talked at the same time for around 20 seconds. We just looked at each other, looked behind, nothing was there. We slowly got uphill, we separated. And with the speed of light, we separated and got home. My parents were sleeping. I just opened their door and said that I got home. And when they saw me from waking up first thing, they asked, Why are you so white? I explained. They shook their heads and said that it was for going through the forest at 2 a.m. I'm lucky I didn't saw anything. I didn't sleep that night. And the next day, I needed to ask my friend what happened to know I was crazy. But he described everything as I remember. So we just sat down and we were like, well, we are alive, so that's good. A few weeks passed, and I was for some reason going on that road alone. Also at night, but around 11 p.m. alone. And nothing like that happened. Later we also got together and also nothing happened, so we used that road a bunch more times and nothing's ever happened like that. I don't know how to end this story, but that was it. Even if it isn't anything grand and nothing actually happened, it's the scariest thing I've lived through. I believe God helped us. We were praying while walking and that demon was behind us. Believe is weak word, I want to say. I know God helped us and that demon was behind. When someone tells me they don't believe in God, but thing there is something, I tell them this story and say to them. I was thinking similar to you before that happened, and I don't want for anyone to go through that, just for confirmation that there's God and demons, not something. We have to give this guy leeway, because he's from Serbia, and this is his second language, so hopefully you guys got that. Demon or just delusion? Okay, so I grew up having multiple paranormal experiences, which I'm sure I'll post more of them. My mom grew up messing with paranormal games and spirits, so I feel like in a way she kind of screwed me over. The one I'm talking about now is about four years ago. I was in my room about to go to sleep. I was turning off my lamp, since I can't sleep with any light on and that was set in the corner of my room. I was facing the lamp and had just turned it off all the way as darkness filled the room when I heard my name being said, almost drawn out in a dark voice like, think of your basic demon voice you make when you're trying to impersonate one. <laughs> At first, I assumed it was my brother trying to scare me, I turned around to confront him. When I turned, there was no one there. The only person in the room was me. I quickly exited my room and checked my parents' and brother's room who were all either sleeping or occupied and wouldn't have been able to make it back to what they were doing without me catching them. I ended up just going to sleep thinking I was just hearing things. The next night, only 24 hours later I was going to bed again and turning my lamp again. There was no voice and I honestly forgot about it. Anyway, about five minutes later, I was covering myself with blankets when I swear on everything, a figure started crossing my room horizontally from me. It looked like if a member of the Blue Man group was painted black. He crossed my room, paused for a second, side-eyed me so subtly. His eyes were brown, but the white around his eyes were the purest white. It was unsettling. After pausing for a second, he continued crossing the room before he just disappeared. I was in shock, but decided not to wake anyone because I didn't want to disturb. I decided to sleep in the living room with the TV on, but it was too uncomfortable. Ended up returning to my room and just falling asleep. Never saw the man again, although I saw different entities. I didn't get an evil vibe from him, but it was unsettling and uncomfortable. To this day, 
I wonder what I saw still gives me chills to think about. Fun fact, that bedroom is still my room and I'm typing this in there right now. Guest in the bathroom. As it happened sometime last year, but as it was happening, the sheer terror I felt at the time was truly unlike any other. I had met her so unexpectedly while I was spending the weekend over at my grandparents' house in the mountains in Indonesia. She was my first ever first-hand encounter with the otherworldly, and she chose to appear when I least expected it, at a place I was so familiar with even though I could remember. She was an uninvited guest who welcomed herself into my grandparents' home, a guest that nobody knew about but me. So the story goes on my first night there at around 2 a.m., finally felt sleepy enough to sleep, so I decided to go to the bathroom just right across the room I was staying at to pee, before handing off to bed. The hallway was dark, but nothing felt weird, it was a familiar sight, and I sensed no danger or threat, so I just walked right into the bathroom to quickly do my business. Again, nothing felt out of the ordinary, everything was as it usually is, until I opened the bathroom door to return to my room, and that door flung back on its own, shutting it again. That was the moment I knew I was fucked. Immediately, the bathroom lights started flickering nonstop, reminiscent of a club, but in the most horrific way considering my circumstances. Without much of a thought... I looked over my shoulder because I felt a presence, and sure enough, there was a girl at the back of the bathroom, completely motionless. However, what's weird was that I couldn't really make out her full form, if that makes sense. Or even her face, because strangely enough, she appeared to be quite blurry, although she was within close proximity, which was probably for the better. At a quick glance, I was only able to tell that she had a disheveled hair and also that her body frame was, well, she was visibly very thin, skinny, even under that bloodied and tattered long white dress she had on. Then it sunk in again. I was locked inside of a haunted bathroom with a female ghost covered in blood standing still beside me while the lights are flickering. For maybe a good minute or two, that felt like an eternity at that. I was frantically trying to open the door in a state of panic to no avail, mind you, all while I was screaming at the top of my lungs, desperate for help for the entire time. But, unfortunately, both of my elderly grandparents have hearing problems. My grandpa especially has pretty much gone deaf. So, I know, all that ruckus still wasn't loud enough to wake any of them up. I was going insane while the other two human beings in the house were sound asleep. For a second felt like I was on the verge of fainting due to shock and the sudden surge of fear that took over my body simply because these things, the supernatural, scares me down to the core. And Indonesia happens to be one of those highly superstitious and quote-unquote active countries with the creepiest ghost species. Although, I can also feel myself shaking and my legs getting weak. The adrenaline was stopping me from fainting. To which would have been preferable considering I could have just woken up the next day and started being in denial, but no. I just had to stay awake the entire time and have the very vivid recollection of everything. Anyways, as soon as the door finally opened, I sprinted back into my room. I just could not believe it myself. I made it back, kind of managed to escape alive and, well, completely unharmed, only traumatized. However, even if that was the case... I still could not even get a wink of sleep that night because I was frightened at the idea that she might have followed me in and thereby continue to haunt me again. Thus, I decided to spend the entire night hiding under the covers so I won't catch sight of her. Even if that case, you know, ignorance is bliss, right? When morning came, I set out to search for a fellow resident whom I've always thought was the bravest and most experienced on this topic. He lives in a separate building, a very haunted one, far away from the main house, to maybe look for some possible explanations. It was one of my grandparents' long-time workers. After I told him about what had happened last night, he told me that he'll look into it, trying to figure out who she was. 
not going to lie. I really just thought what I saw was the Indo ghost called Kuntilanak, solely from its appearance. The classic long black hair, white bloody dress, and nothing else. Fast forward to the next day. To my surprise, he had news for me already. He told me that apparently after asking around the area, he discovered that just recently, sometime around last week in fact, there was a young lady, a motorcyclist who was unfortunately involved in a deadly accident that killed her on impact. In a gruesome manner, her head got sort of crushed. Along the road of where my grandparents' house was situated on too, my heart sank. Could that be her, the girl I saw that night? But why the fuck would she be here of all places? Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit icky because a paranormal is now involved after I told my highly superstitious dad about all this. Apparently, according to my dad's long-time trusted paranormal, yeah, this kind of is a thing in Indonesia, kind of like how each family has their own family doctor, and this man is my family paranormal. Though I've always thought he's full of bullshit ever since I was a kid. They had managed to communicate with her. He basically confirmed what my grandparents' worker had told me. Additionally, as a result of her very sudden death, she was unable to rest in peace. Moreover, move on to the next stage following death to her afterlife. Hence, she resorted to showing herself to me, albeit forcefully, which was apparently her way of seeking help. My help that night. I forgot exactly why or what she wanted me to help her with, but I seriously don't know why it had to be me of all people within the vicinity. In the end... The paranormal decided to just pray for her, and he either said she was moved out of my grandparents' property by him or was able to move on to the afterlife with the assistance of his prayer. I can't remember because it's been at least a half a year since it happened, but either way, he said he feels bad for her and pities her, so he decided to lend her a helping hand. Afterwards, the paranormal kept reassuring us that she was no longer at my grandparents' house, and that he's reinforced the prayer wall barrier, quote-unquote. And this is something that was surrounding the main house area that was weakening. Yes, you read all that right. He apparently puts up prayer wall barriers and seals the area, preventing ghosts and spirits that are not blood-related to my family lineage from entering. And this is in every single one of my dad's properties, too. Even the ones overseas. <laughs> but because that was how she was able to breach those wall barriers and enter it through a gap and... Well, to be honest, all I care about is the fact that she's gone. Never tested, nor have the means to even do a test anyway. At least of his skill, ability, powers, or legitimacy. However, that was something that I chose to believe without question in order to give myself some peace of mind. Besides my family members, I seriously couldn't care any less even if all that shit was made up about all that paranormal. As long as she's out and never to return... End of story. Honestly, as I'm recounting all this again in great detail for the first time in months to write this post, on second thought, I think I'll for sure be traumatized for life. All because it's been, as I said, several months and the memory of physically being in that locked bathroom with her takes me right back. And this is enough to send chills up and down my spine again and again. I wish I could say that I was hallucinating at the time or something, but I didn't. And I've had to live with this sort of chilling memory in my head ever since. From this time onward, I've been refusing to spend another night at my grandparents' house whenever I visit Indonesia. As much as I cherish that place and spending time with my grandparents at their own home. However, I just can't get over my trauma and paranoia. And it truly is a shame. But it is what it is. Running in the hallway. When I was 18 years old, I had this ex who I would visit often at his trailer home. He was still living with his parents and his younger siblings at the time, and on this particular day, his family was out of the house for some event. So we were the only ones in the home. Now I have to explain the layout of the home in order for you to understand why this kind of messed us up so bad. It was sort of like a rectangle in order to go to his room, you'd have to walk down this little narrow hallway. We were just hanging out in his room and watching TV. I was laying on the bed while he was on the floor for some reason. can't remember too well. 
I was starting to fall asleep. That's when I see him turn his head toward his bedroom door. I asked him if he heard something. He shushed me. He then tells me that he thought he heard something, but then continued doing what he was doing. He then joined me on the bed, and we just laid there watching TV. I see my ex perk up again and sits up on the bed. I muted the TV and was trying to listen to whatever he kept hearing. I heard creaking, like someone was in the living room walking around. We assumed that his family got home, so we just continued to watch whatever show was on at that time. As soon as I was about to unmute the TV, we heard running. You know how in scary movies there's always the scene when you hear that phantom running toward him? That's what it felt like in that moment. The running footsteps get louder and louder, each step sounding like whoever was running was digging their feet in in order to mark it. We were just in the room looking at each other, just waiting for someone to burst through the door. The running then came to a stop once they reached the door. Sounds kind of silly, but believe me, we were fucking terrified. Just the way it sounded, each step getting louder and louder, the way you were able to feel the vibrations coming off of it. My ex then asked me if I had heard that. I nodded yes, but tried to cover it up with a lame excuse, saying, Well, maybe he's coming from the trailer next door. I didn't want to admit to him that I was scared shitless. I went home a little after that happened and got a text from him. He texted, Do you really think that came from the other trailer? I texted him back and told him, I'm sorry, I admit it. I did hear it. It scared the shit out of me. That's why I left. Nothing like that ever happened again during the time we were together. We did mention that a couple months later that we were working on something underneath the trailer. He and his dad ended up finding remains. They called the police to pick them up. They came and never heard anything back since then. A Growl From Hell When I was around 16 or 17, I had to share a room with my younger sister. I was very thankful I shared this room with her. We always heard some of the weirdest noises. Either that, or we would have some crazy nightmares that felt so real. And that's why I wanted to share this encounter. It was around summertime. We used to leave the windows cracked open to let the cool breeze in. It was late at night, maybe close to midnight. At that time, I enjoyed putting on MTV to fall asleep to. Something about hearing music late at night just helps you ease into your slumber. Anyway, I'm just watching the music videos they were playing on the TV when my sister and I hear this gut-wrenching, deep, hateful growl outside by our window. That scared the absolute shit out of us. We literally grabbed each other and asked ourselves if we both heard it. I can't even begin to explain how terrifying that growl was my stomach and, not, and a bird sorry that growl is the stuff you hear in movies but even then it sounded just so unbelievably real my sister and i tried to come up with a reasonable explanation as to what it could be but we couldn't find one it couldn't have been a dog the way it growled was just too deep for a dog to do needless to say we stayed up all night until finally we saw daybreak then passed out from the exhaustion has anyone ever experienced or heard something like this? I'm telling you, this wasn't normal, nor did it feel safe, and I'm 28 now and still remember clearly how disturbing that growl sounded and what it made us feel that night. White Cryptid Creature I'm 23 now. This happened sometime when I was in high school. I'm thinking around 11th or 12th grade. I lived at home at that time, and by my house were two elementary schools separated by some forest, joined together by a paved bicycle-slash-walking trail through said forest. It was nighttime. My best friend at that time and I were out walking the trail from one school to another. To paint a good picture of what this trail was like, for some reason there were only like street lights at the end of the trail where you'd be entering school property. The trail itself was pitch black, almost making it super eerie at night. Anyways, my buddy and I were coming around a bend just outside of where the first school was, and where there was a light. But, 
As we approached the bend in the trail, we made it to a point where the light was barely letting up the trail anymore. I was walking with my head down, looking at my phone. My friend was just a few steps ahead talking, when out of nowhere he stops and goes, The fuck is that? Naturally, I stop too, and at first I don't see anything. I caught up to where he was, and he takes a few steps ahead of me, and he said, Look over there in the bush, that white thing. Now, when I saw this thing, I absolutely froze. Sitting at the side of the trail off the pavement in this trail in the tall grass was this hunched over, super pale white thing. It looked like a person who was super skinny to the point where I could see its spine bones and rib cage. At first, I thought, well, maybe it's a crackhead. But it almost looked more like a dog without a tail or hair. When we first saw it, it had its back to us, and then turned towards us. It looked like a bald, pale, naked white man with absolutely no hair, severely undernourished and sunken in eyes and super long arms moving towards us on all fours like an animal. We didn't even say a word to each other, we just both immediately started running the opposite direction to get home. We nearly sprinted the entire way back, which was like one and a half-ish kilometers. We told my parents when we got home, and the next day in the daylight, of course, my mom and I went back to where my friend and I saw this thing. And sure enough, right where we saw it, a bunch of packed down long grass as if something were sitting there or laying there. I actually messaged this friend who witnessed it with me. I was writing this and he still remembers it clear as day. And the fact that it looked almost like a creature mixed with a human. We have no clue what it was. I was wondering if anybody on here has a similar story. Thanks for the read. Cheers. Cheers back to you. Ghost slash paranormal experiences. My own and from people I know. Jane and John lived together in a home with their daughter, Laura. Jane and John would always be hearing things. Laura would always be seeing things. The fire alarm would always go off in the middle of the night. Every night after Laura went to bed, after Jane had read her a story, and after she'd sort of heard her parents get into bed, she'd always get up to get a glass of water from the bathroom. She remembers one night listening for her parents to get into bed, then getting up, opening her door, to see that it was daylight. She looked and saw John standing in his bedroom doorway, and he tells her good morning. She stood there, confused as hell, because to her, no time had passed. She'd just honed bed about 30 seconds earlier. The day just went along as usual. Laura would always see dark figures bolting past doorways. She'd even try to chase them. Whenever she saw them, she'd run after them and not find anything and then run and tell Jane and John that she saw Dark Sidious. And we'd run across the doorway. Jane and John believed her because they too had seen similar. But they told her it was just her eyes playing tricks on her in order to keep her calm. Jane would get up for work at six in the morning every weekday. One morning she saw a figure standing under the tree in, front lawn, or in their front lawn. Excuse me. It was glowing faintly blue, and it was wearing a long white cloak. It was tall, had an elongated face, and appeared to be mumbling something. She stared right at it for a good minute, walked to her car briskly, not breaking eye contact with it. Once she was in her car, she calls John, told him to come out and see it. He came out and saw nothing. He wasn't in any disbelief. However, as he'd also experienced strange things in that house, one day, uh, sorry, I'm so starving that I'm messing up. One night, they were sitting in the living room at night. They were sharing a bottle of wine, watching TV. In unison, their eyes followed a black figure which passed swiftly by the windows. First the kitchen window, then the back door. They both saw it looked at each other, confirming that they were both indeed seeing what they were seeing. John would also hear footsteps sliding across the carpet in the basement, especially while home alone. John frantically ran around the house one day, because he could hear a tap running. 
I don't know whether or not he had found the running tap, nor does he remember this specific instant. Yet, when John was small, his grandmother passed away. Some days after her death at her funeral, he asked her to come and visit and to move some things in his room. If he happened to be asleep... Okay, later that night while John was asleep, he opened his eyes only for a moment to see a small Garfield figurine floating past his bedroom window. He'd assumed it was only a dream when, sure enough, when he woke up, the figurine was sitting right there in his lap. He still had the figurine and keeps it safe to this day. The same night John's grandmother passed, his sister Bethany was visiting by her grandmother in her dream. Her grandmother told Bethany that she was very cold. When Jane's father Eric passed away, her cousin Vera had a dream. During Vera's childhood, Eric was like a father to her. Vera dreamt that Eric had come to visit her, to comfort her. The next day, Vera called Jane to ask if everything was alright with Eric, received the news of his passing. While driving to Eric's funeral, Jane, John, and Jane's sister Nancy and her husband Daniel were in the car. Jane was driving. The highway was extremely icy, and it was snowing heavily. Jane, devastated by her father's passing, was crying, was unable to see the road clearly through her teary eyes, and all that snow. Suddenly the volume on the radio began to increase, slowly, to an almost deafening level. Then slowly it came back down. When Jane and Nancy were small, Eric would do this to the car stereo while driving if Jane and Nancy were making too much noise in the back seats, distracting him. At first... Jane had thought either John or Daniel had the stereo remote and were just playing some sick joke. But the remote was tucked away in the glove compartment. Jane felt comfort knowing her father was still there to protect her from danger. Some years later, Eric's brother Mark passed away. Jane, John, Nancy, Daniel, and Laura attended. While at the funeral, John felt an extremely strong and evil presence, as if there were something threatening or attacking Mark. John believes he has a very strong connection to his past lives and the spirits he encountered. When John was an infant, he would often cry out at night, as most babies do. His parents, Rose and Bob, brought him to a temple to have the demons removed from him. After the temple visit, he never cried out at night again. John believes he had been crying out at night because of his past life. In his past life, he was a monk. He believes that he had evil spirits trapped within him because of this, and that those spirits were removed upon his visit to the temple. Daniel's father passed recently, and while visiting his father's house shortly after he passed, he noticed that the clock in the kitchen had stopped the exact moment he died, and a yellow canary watched him through the window of every room he entered. When Jane was starting her career as a nurse, she worked in a nursing home. An elderly woman on her deathbed had not had the strength to speak or move for an entire week. Then one day while Jane was in the room with her, she sat up, asked for a glass of water. She then looked up into the corner of the room and had the warmest smile on her face. Jane asked her what she was looking at. The woman told Jane she was looking at the Virgin Mary. The woman was in total bliss. Jane brought her a glass of water and she succumbed to her old age within an hour. Laura's close friend Jonas unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Jonas had taken his own life in the basement of his home. For the months after Jonas's death, Laura had been receiving silent phone calls from Jonas's number. She'd pick up the phone and hear silence before the call ended. She'd also hear more of Jonas's favorite songs on the radio or they would shuffle more frequently in her playlist. These were songs that would often be sung over the phone, and these occurrences stopped about five months after Jonas's death. In Laura's current home, not child at home, she had seen lights turning on by themselves, items mysteriously falling off shelves and doors closing on their own. To Laura, these occurrences are not frequent enough to be considered a haunting, she believes they are simply spirits passing through the area, not intending to cause any harm, and not staying in her home. My 
boyfriend talks in his sleep. This is an actual true story about what happened in December. I didn't think about posting the story here until just now. But here I am, and I'm sharing it. For the sake of anonymity, places and names will be switched out. My boyfriend and I have been together for over two years now. When this occurred, we've been living together in an apartment for almost a year. I'm going to refer to him as John and myself as Jane. One thing about my boyfriend is that he is, I wouldn't call him psychic or medium, but both him and some of his family have ability to feel presences. Something that no one can see or hear but him and some of his other relatives can just notice. This was prevalent a lot in the first apartment that we lived in as a place was quite an odd one. John would feel some type of energy in the apartment every now and then. Since I'm a person who can get quite spooked, I quickly told him to save the stories of the presences he could pick up until we had moved out of there. Kindly enough of him, he did. John has shared some of the details after we moved away from there. They were pretty creepy, in my opinion. When we then moved into our current apartment that was built pretty recently, John could confirm that he did not feel any of those energies in there. I was relieved by this, as I'm sure you can understand. Another thing about John is that he talks in his sleep. It happens about once a week as far as I'm aware of. I'm a pretty heavy sleeper, but I can sometimes wake up by him talking nonsense or giggling out of nowhere. It's usually just a sentence, if even that. Sometimes it's just a word, maybe two. I've tried several times to record him in his sleep, but so far no luck in that plan. With all of this information shared, let me tell you the story that, you know, brought me to write this in the first place. In the beginning of December, me, John, and my dad had decided to visit my grandma. I hadn't seen her for quite some time. She lives about a two-hour drive away from us. My grandma has this doll. She's called Rebecca. It's a regular plastic doll with blonde hair. It's about the size of a small child. When growing up, my dad would tell me these stories of Rebecca the doll. Ouch. Stories about her making things and moving places when he was home as a kid, but I had, of course, shared these stories with John. He'd laugh at them. As a woman of her early 20s, I wouldn't say that I was scared of Rebecca, not even sure if I believed the stories that my dad told me. But having seen a lot of horror movies, many of them containing dolls, I have grown a respect for Rebecca. No need to provoke her, just to stay on the safe side. When visiting my grandma, I of course needed to show John the doll. She's placed in the corner of my grandma's bedroom, so me and John went in there, and out of nowhere John decides to flip his finger at Rebecca. I instantly felt panic and told John to apologize to Rebecca, just to be on the safe side. John says no, laughed it off, left the room. I quickly followed. I didn't want to be left alone in the room with that doll, especially after what had just happened. We returned home that same night, neither of us talking about the doll for the rest of the day. I had honestly forgotten about it already since we also decided to visit my cousins who lived in the same town as my grandma. Me and John went to sleep around midnight. Despite being a heavy sleeper, my boyfriend falls asleep before I do most nights. And this happened that night as well. I remember that I was about to fall asleep, but John nudged me with his elbow as he was looking for me. He said, Jane, several times. Gave up on ignoring him and asked him what he wanted. What are you doing? He said. I asked him what he meant. Are you standing there in the corner? He responded. I instantly got chills down my spine. What do you mean? I asked back. Yes, you're there in the corner. Why are you staring at me? He replied. The room was pitch black. If there indeed was someone standing in the corner of that room, there's no way either of us could have seen it. No, what are you talking about? I'm laying next to you. I responded, terrified at this point. All right, okay, he said. Then he was quiet again, sleeping heavily. I felt ridiculous taking my phone and pointing the flashlight toward the corners of the room. 
Of course, I wouldn't see anything, but just knowing that my boyfriend had felt something with us in the room was enough for me to barely get any sleep that night. When waking up the next morning, John had no recollection of what had happened during the night. When I told him, he laughed at me and apologized for ruining my sleep. At first, I thought he was lying. The whole thing had been a prank, just to scare me, perhaps. But John is a terrible liar, and I know he was honest about him having slept through the whole thing. For Christmas, we went back to my grandma. I went back into her bedroom and I apologized to Rebecca on behalf of John and myself. Nothing similar has happened since. I've shared this story to friends and family, all who have thought it was pretty funny. I can't shake the feeling that it was actually the presence of Rebecca in our bedroom that night that we had apparently upset, and maybe she followed us home. Two Demons Across the Street This was years ago. I may have been 16, may have been 17. But while I was visiting my mother in Virginia Beach, I was sitting on the couch watching TV doing nothing, just enjoying myself. It was late at night. As I'm sitting on the couch, I had this very strong feeling someone or something was watching me. And at the same time, the feeling let me know it wasn't a good presence at all. I tried shaking it off, thinking it would pass, but it didn't. It was like it wanted me to know it was there. So, eventually I got up, walked over to the window, looked between the blinds and the standing across the street. There were two demons staring back at me. As I stood there trying to wrap my head around what I was looking at, I will never forget what they looked like. Two demons wearing all black with a black cloak on with the hood over their head. One had burning all red eyes and the other burning green eyes as they just stood there smirking at me as if asking to come outside or letting themselves be known that they were watching me. I could barely make out the complete face because it was dark, but I was able to see some of it and it definitely wasn't human. Needless to say, I was paralyzed with fear. But once I was able to move, I thought to myself, let me go get my sister to justify what I'm seeing, or hopefully they'll be gone by the time I come back to the window, or she can tell me I'm hallucinating. I ran into my sister's room, begging her to come into the living room with me, and of course she felt like I was annoying her, because I wouldn't tell her what I wanted, but she did finally agree to follow me to the living room. I told her to look out the window. She had this annoyed look on her face and said, fine. But when she looked... Her whole expression changed after a couple of seconds of her looking. She asked me, Are those... are those two demons? Craziest Night of My Life Hi. To put some preface on this story before I get into it, I'm a Division I football player that plays offensive line. For those that don't know what that is, I'm basically saying I'm a big dude. Currently about six foot five, 300 pounds. Basically saying I haven't really been scared of animals or people where I live because I'm genuinely just bigger than them. Now, it was a late night after my high school basketball team at the time, and they had made the playoffs. I was currently on the phone with my girlfriend at the time as I was pulling into my country neighborhood in a small road in Alabama. It was around 12.31 a.m. I was pulling into the neighborhood and I see this woman with long black hair wearing like a, like a Civil War period dress. It wasn't very weird for me to see random kids around my neighborhood because, well, I lived near a foster home. But what freaked me out at first is that it was January or February and at this late at night, it was freezing. I pull into my neighborhood, I had to drive past her. Slowly going about 3 p.m. past this woman. Maybe, maybe three miles an hour. Past this woman. I really didn't know what to do as I passed. She was still just staring at the ground. As I checked my rearview mirror, her head snapped up. And I saw an extremely evil looking face. I hung up the phone and was going about 65 to my house. 
As I mentioned, I'm a big dude, and when I arrived at my house, I sprint up my porch stairs into my room. Me being my size, that woke everyone in my house up. My dad enters my room to check on me, and me telling him everything that's happened. He asked if I was on anything. I told him of course I wasn't. He told me to get some sleep, and of course I couldn't sleep. It popped in my head and just I had a Latina neighbor that was very close. And they had long jet black hair. Instantly I snapped her on Snapchat saying, that was a good prank that you got me. She said she wasn't even in the state, didn't know what I was talking about. She sent me her location on the snap map showing me that she was in Baltimore. That was it. No chance I was getting any sleep that night. Hopped on Xbox to tell all my friends about the events that just occurred too. Of course, they didn't believe me, saying I was joking, and I told them how serious I was though. At the end of the Xbox session, it was like 4 a.m. I'd gotten off and was going to try to sleep. Went to my bedroom, and as I was walking past the blinds, there she was, standing there in one street light in my neighborhood. I slammed the curtain shut, peeked again. She was gone no idea what happened or what was going on that night. My dad and little brother have claimed to see the same woman years later in their own different stories. Scariest Night of My Life Follow-Up Family Stories in Research Part 2 What's up, y'all? I'm excited to see y'all all got to read my encounter. I never thought how many people would see it. Since my encounter, I've now moved to college to play football, as I've mentioned earlier. And now that I've left my brother as well as my dad, they've had encounters with a similar character to the one that I had seen. I've also done some research, and I'll get into that as well. Brother. One night, I would say a year ago. My brother was packing up around 10 p.m. to go to a baseball tournament in Atlanta the next day as he was loading up the car. He heard a noise, and this noise sounded like a woman far away in the woods. He thought it was our neighbors or something. My brother finished putting the last bag in the back of the car, and then he looks in our driveway and sees the woman fitting the description of my encounter standing there. My brother isn't small either had made fun of me for the way I'd acted when I had my encounter. Anyways, as he saw the woman standing there, she did the same thing. He couldn't see her face because of her long jet black hair. He said that he said hello and are you okay? She said and did nothing. She snapped her head up and he said he saw a horrible looking face. He sprinted up through the porch and locked the doors. He peeked out the window and she was staring back. When he peeked back, she was gone. Father. This one isn't long, but it's still an encounter. My dad works around the country because of his job and finds himself coming home late sometimes. As he was driving home late one night, he saw the woman that I had described, but this time next to the cemetery we live near. I have no idea if this is a connection to her or not, but we have never stepped foot in that place. Anyways, he saw this woman, same description as both of our encounters, and passed her. He checked his mirror, and she was still there. He turned around his car and just to get a better look. She was gone. Research. I'm not into horror films, or really anything scary for that matter, but I have done some research since my encounter. But this is definitely a new field for me, so any advice would be great. The website that tells about ghosts in our area of Alabama and turns out I live near an old iron mill. And to sum up the short story, this woman and her child were killed by a fallen chimney about one minute from where I live. She seems to be sighted from time to time and she's labeled as a stalker, or that's mostly friendly or doesn't hurt anyone, but I have no idea to be honest. Seeing things as I wake up. But it's something that's never happened to me in 27 years of life. And I would love to hear thoughts or even similar stories. So to preface. Me and my boyfriend lived in a house where two previous owners have unfortunately passed away in. The second being his dad. 
we moved in after his passing to keep the house and the family. I've had small stuff happen from time to time in the two years we've lived here. Like the first two months we lived here, it was freezing all the time in the house, and I usually run warm and don't get too cold easily. I thought I saw my lampshade move on its own. A light I swear I turned off is on again later. About six months ago, I remember waking up in the middle of the night to turn over and face my boyfriend. I wrap my arms around him, open my eyes, and I see what looks exactly like his father standing over my boyfriend's side of the bed. I couldn't see features, but as if a man was truly above our bed with his father's hair, his father's height and build. It took everything in me not to scream, and I'm surprised I didn't wake up my boyfriend with how bad I jolted and gasped. My eyes adjusted and realized I was looking at a poster that we have on our wall of some big dragon animal. I shook it off, but truly never knew if what I saw was real. Never happened again. But last week I was facing the other way, woke up to what I thought was a scary little girl who looked like a doll with button eyes. But in a heartbeat shifted back into my dresser. That one woke my boyfriend up since I screamed and jumped over to him. I want to understand why this is happening. So again, I'd love thoughts. Children running in the hallway for years. My wife and I had a repeated unexplained experience over several years. Usually late at night and quite often, just as we'd gotten into bed, we would hear what sounded like children running up and down our corridor. Of course, we had none. This was ten plus years ago. The house we were in was built in the 80s and had been renovated in the mid-2000s to include an extension of a large living room, an extra bedroom, and an end suite. This joined the rest of the house by a short passageway, a room away from our bedroom, mind you. The sound would sometimes begin in the middle of the night and one of us would just wake the other. For me, it was with a sense of confusion and creeping fear. It clearly sounded like someone small and light, maybe two of them running up and down the hallway that joined the original house in the extension. We would sit up in bed and listen for minutes on end. And then as if turning and running back up the hallway, in my memory, I can feel the hair on the back of my neck sticking up while listening to it and staring wide-eyed at each other through the dark in utter disbelief at what we were hearing. And of course, any investigation would reveal only silence. As soon as you would take a step toward the hall, the noise would stop. This happened so often it stopped being a surprise. My wife told me a story tonight, which is what prompted me to post this for the first time. That one weekend while I was away, the noise was so loud and persistent that she had to shut the door just to sleep. The house had apparently only had one owner previously. Nobody had died in the home. A fact which was independently researched by the owners after we told them. The owners were both in the police force and had the means to confirm those type of queries. It's something we talk about today over a decade later and we're just as confused now as we were back then. Spooky Experience in an Old Belgian Hotel A colleague and I attended a seminar in Belgium. We were billeted in a hotel housed in a building from the 19th century. While the interiors had been modernized, they retained the old facade of the building, lending a lot of character to it. At the end of the busy first day, my colleague and I went to the back room to rest before joining the other participants for a night out. I went to the bathroom to freshen up while my colleague started dozing off in his bed. I had been in the bathroom for ten minutes when I heard blood-curdling screams coming from the bedroom. I ran outside to see what was happening found my colleague having a nightmare, I shook him vigorously to wake him up. When he did wake up, I asked him what he dreamt of. He said he had a very vivid dream where he saw several children huddled together on the side of our room. They looked like they were dressed from another era. They looked frightened, 
A European nun then walked in and pressed her hands tightly around his neck. That's when he started screaming. We dismissed the nightmare as a result of jet lag or exhaustion. The following morning, when we were having breakfast at the hotel restaurant, we asked the waiter what the building was previously. Apparently, the building was initially a convent, and then was transformed into an orphanage run by nuns up into the 1980s, before it was abandoned and then later converted into a hotel. We got goosebumps after hearing the story. After recalling his nightmare, we thought maybe it was not really a nightmare. Instead, he had a ghostly preview of the hotel's past. I think a demon is attached to my mom, and it has controlled her life. This is not just an experience. This has been my whole entire life. Let's go back in time to when my mother was a young girl. My nana, her mother, had gone over to a friend's house to have a night of drinking. There were plenty of kids fooling around and deciding to go into the house and explore, as kids do. They came across bones, lots and lots of animal bones and goat heads that she had been touching them. Went inside to show everybody, but they had just shrugged her off. That night, her and my nana had crashed out in the lounge on the floor on the mattress. My nana awoke looked over at my mom, and standing there was a very tall black entity with a male statue. Perhaps stature. Its head bent down just staring at my mother. She believes this is where it all began. Now to when I'm alive and my siblings and our life took a turn. We had moved a lot during childhood, but every single house we lived in we encountered a very demonic presence within it. From slamming cabinets to laughing in the middle of the night, Banging on the front and back doors, objects being thrown, shadows under doors, hooves walking down the hallways, names being called, beings pushed, being hurt physically with starches. I think they mean, <laughs> I think they mean scratches. Hair being pulled, sounds of bells, and never without a doubt the feeling of being watched. It's still to this day is active, but still moving out of home. Nothing has happened in my own home, nor a sibling, well, it's a big, big sense. It's still to this day is active, but since moving out of our home, nothing has happened in my own home, nor my other siblings' home, only when we return to that house where my mom lives. We've even caught a photo of my mom sleeping on the bed with the wardrobe open and a demonic face was in there just watching her. I've always wanted to reach out and contact the spirit of whatever the hell it is, but I know that's the most dangerous thing I can do. I'm worried for my mom, what may happen to her? Just know that it wants something. <laughs>